agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Yes, I have a very brief executive director's report. Uh, I want to remind folks that we are going on the road next week. We'll be going down to Mount Stepney Hospital in, oh goodness, what's down there again? Windsor, right? So we'll be there for our board meeting. We'll also be visiting some community providers in the Upper Valley. So uh, if you're available, take, take a road trip with us. The other thing I'd like to announce is if uh, folks could sign in as out on the table in the um, entrance. Uh, if you could just make sure you sign in, and um, that's all I have to report today. So before we go to the next item, which is the minutes, uh, Mike and Melissa, can you get set up? So uh, the next item is are the minutes of October 17th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, October 17th. Without any additions, deletions, or corrections, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike and Melissa to give us an intro into the uh, One Care Vermont uh, budget uh, presentation that we're about to uh, participate in. Okay. Thank you. For the record, my name is Michael Barber, Chief of Health Policy at the Green Mountain Care Board, and to my right is Melissa Miles, Health Policy Project Director for the board. And um, so we're just going to do a, a fairly brief introduction to uh, to the hearing uh, on One Care Vermont's fiscal year 2019 budget. Um, so this is the schedule for this afternoon. We're going to try and keep our introductory remarks to uh, less than 15 minutes. One Care will have an hour for their presentation. There's an hour for uh, board members to ask questions and for um, questions potentially from Jackie Lee from Lewis and Ellis, who hopefully is on the phone. Um, then the healthcare advocate will have 30 minutes to ask questions. And lastly, there'll be time for public comment. I would also note that uh, the board does accept written public comments via its website at any time that's up and running currently. So since you are just coming off of the hospital budget season, we thought it would be good to just step back for a second and revisit the theory behind the all-payer accountable care organization model. And this slide is trying to show you that uh, the all-payer model is an attempt, attempt to solve a problem one that is not unique to Vermont for sure. Uh, and the problem is that the cost of health care is increasing at an unsustainable rate, and there's room to improve both the health of Vermonters and the quality of care that they receive. Um, one strategy for solving this problem is to have providers from across the continuum uh, work together to deliver care in a more integrated and coordinated way, to focus more on primary care and prevention, to deliver care in lower cost settings where appropriate, and to reduce duplication of services. Um, to incentivize and facilitate the kinds of changes in the way care is delivered, the other part of the strategy is to change the way that we pay for health care, to move away from a fee-for-service payment model that rewards providers for delivering more services, and to move towards population-based payments. Uh, where providers accept responsibility for the health of a group of patients in exchange for a set amount of money. The hypothesis is this will be a more predictable and sustainable financial model for payers and providers, will spur providers to work together in new ways, and will give providers flexibility to make choices and in investments that make sense for their patients, but that might not have made sense, uh, financial sense at least, in a fee-for-service world. The state chose to implement this strategy through a statewide accountable care organization model in which the majority of Vermonters are served under ACO programs that are aligned with one another so that providers have clear and consistent incentives. Under this model, ACOs are supposed to be the vehicle for change. They're supposed to help providers succeed in managing this transformation by providing support, data, analytics, and sometimes by shifting money to areas that need it most. Um, 
As you know, the all-payer model agreement signed in 2016 enabled Medicare to participate in this kind of model. We are pretty early in the implementation of the model, 2018 being the first performance year. Uh, however, for 2018, we have four fairly well-aligned ACO payer programs in place, serving approximately 120, excuse me, 112,000 Vermonters, uh, which is a major step, but short of where we are supposed to be under the agreement in terms of scale. Um, this graphic is, is meant to build on the last slide and just illustrate that the payment reforms really reinforce and enable the transformations in care delivery with the ultimate goal being uh, to achieve improvements in health and slower cost growth. A key concept here is that when you put providers at risk for the cost and quality of care delivered to patients, it will spur increased investments in and focus on primary care and prevention since there is a consensus that strong primary care foundation with uh, an enhanced focus on preventive services can improve healthcare quality, improve the health of the population, and keep costs down. The last column here um, describes the three population health goals that are found in the all-payer model agreement, and these are the, um, again, population level outcomes that Vermont is trying to positively impact through the model. And this slide is to very briefly remind you of what Vermont is responsible for under the all-payer model agreement, because um, you can and should consider uh, relevant requirements of the all-payer model agreement when you're reviewing and approving an ACO's budget. The requirements in the agreement generally relate to cost, cost growth, rather, uh, alignment of programs, scale, and quality. With respect to cost, the state is responsible for limiting all-payer cost growth to below a compound annual growth rate of 3.5% over the five-year term of the agreement. It is also responsible for limiting um, Medicare cost growth to uh, given 0.2% oh, below national projections based on what happened last year. Um, the state is responsible for ensuring the alignment of payer programs in certain key areas, uh, specifically attribution, um, uh, attribution uh, services included for determining shared savings or losses, um, risk arrangements, and quality. Um, the state is also expected to meet fairly aggressive scale targets or targets for the percentages of uh, people that are attributed to the ACO or an ACO participating in the model. And finally, the state is responsible for meeting 20 different quality measures that are tied to and build up to the three overarching population health goals that you saw on the last slide, um, improving access to primary care, reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and reducing the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. This slide shows the regulatory levers you have in which to operate uh, at the level of the ACO. Obviously, you have responsibility for reviewing ACO budgets and payer programs. You also have the ACO certification responsibility, which all fell under Act 113. Um, we did certify OneCare earlier this year, and we've asked them to provide us documents so that we can review their continued eligibility for certification. We are in the process of reviewing those, but that is not the subject of today's conversation. So finally, you have the ability to work with Medicare on designing an ECO program for 2019 and to uh, um, establish the benchmark or financial targets for the ACO in that program. So, we made some decisions on the design of the Medicare program earlier this year, and there will be a few more decisions that we'll be coming back to you with in, a, in the coming weeks. So the Medicare benchmark and Medicare rate are intertwined with the ACO budget process, and I imagine OneCare will touch on the Medicare rate in their presentation today. There we go. It wasn't moving. Um, so this is the budget review criteria as set forth in 18 VSA 9382B. Um, 
Many of the criteria relate to the strategy that underlies the all-payer model, and this is not an exact list, but it gives highlights that we certainly look for when we are reviewing the budgets. So one example is how the ACO is working to prevent duplication of services and integrating with the Blueprint for Health and Communities. Another is how the ACO plans to invest in primary care and community-based services and to promote seamless coordination of care and address social determinants of health. We also need to consider how the ACO is supporting improved population health outcomes and also rewarding healthy lifestyle choices. And finally, while these are the statutory criteria, as Mike mentioned a few slides back under the rule, you should also consider any relevant requirements of the all pair model agreement. Um, I, I wanted to say on the last slide that um, the board is supposed to ensure that an ACO has in place a financial guarantee sufficient to cover its potential losses. This is actually a requirement of certification, but it's something that we are looking at, at the, during the budget process. Um, the way that this is done under Rule 5 is that an ACO has to propose a maximum amount of risk that it wants to accept in the upcoming year and has to provide the board with a plan for how to manage that risk. And then the board then approves that max maximum risk amount as part of the ACO's budget. I wanted to highlight several of the ACO budget order items that the board ended up approving on December 21st in 2018. Mm, sorry, 2017. <laughs> 2017 for the 2018 budget. Um, these are some of the items, and but they are not limited to a maximum downside risk, uh, risk corridors that averaged a, about 4% among all the payers, a reserve requirement of 2.2 million, an administrative expense ratio that did not exceed 2%, population health investments that did not go below 3% of their total budget, and uh, that was an estimated 25 million at the beginning of last year, subject to change. The Medicare rate of growth was 3.5 for 2018. Um, we also looked at all of the scale target ACO initiatives that they had among the four payers by which they're contracting with this year. So finally, this is the timeline that we have been working under. Um, we've been reviewing since October 1st, One Care's budget. Uh, today is our hearing, and we are hoping to be able to adhere to this timeline, but as you'll see, we do have um, potential votes for November 28th and December 3rd. Uh, we are waiting from for some information that has not been finalized at this time from um, both Medicaid for Lewis and Ellis to be able to complete the Medicaid advisory rate case that is in statute. And um, there are some unknowns still that One Care may speak to also in terms of their self-funded programs for 19 and the commercial QHP program. So we're doing our best to work within this time frame, but we may need to come back to you with an adjustment. And that's it. Any mm -hmm. questions for Mike or Melissa? Um, um, just on the timeline, uh, my recollection is that um, the the relevant, really legal document that would impact any timing issues would be requirements on, around the Medicare rate. But am I forgetting anything, or do we have some flexibility there? Uh, you remember, your memory correctly. So the all payer ACO model agreement requires that we submit a rate to CMS. Uh, 30 days prior to the beginning of the performance year, so that would put us at the end of November. We would like to meet that, but we do have some flexibility if we need it. Thank you. And last year, we waited an extra two weeks for the information, correct? That's correct. This year, we will be getting the Medicare um, final information by, I believe, November 9th, so that shouldn't be an issue this year. I think Medicare is on track to give us what we need. Um, we are behind where we thought we would be in terms of getting information from DIVA for the Medicaid rate case, and uh, there's a lot of other uncertainty in the budget that may um, lead us to try and push this back a little bit. Okay. Great. Any other questions? 
Okay, thank you very much. Todd and Wood Care team, if you could come down. At this point, I would ask the court reporter to swear in um, those that are at the table. And Todd, is there anybody in the audience that you're going to have offer any testimony? Uh, none that we have plenty. Okay. Could you all raise your right hands, please? If you saw the testimony you're about to give, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. I do want to introduce uh, Kevin Stone is here, who is the uh, chair of the One Care Board and made the trip up uh, to be in the audience. So thank you for being here, Kevin. Um, I, I just want to, as Way's introduction, uh, say that I'm Todd Moore, CEO of One Care Vermont, uh, and I'm here with uh, team members Tom Boris, Director of Finance, Sarah Berry, Director of uh, Clinical and Quality, and Karen Lee, our Vice President of Finance. Be the four of us that will be uh, doing the presentation uh, for you today. Uh, a lot of it will be Tom and Sarah doing the bulk of the uh, uh, presentation slides, uh, with Karen and I offering more uh, uh, commentary at certain points. And, and in response to questions. Uh, I do want to uh, just put a couple things in context before we get uh, get going, which is um, we're still early in this all-payer model, um, and it continues to be you know, quite a worthwhile but complex journey to understand how this should work and, and will work. And, you know, the all-payer model agreement doesn't answer all the questions that get into the details of our budgets and programs or, or even your regulatory standing uh, over it. But I, I do want to thank uh, Michael and Melissa, uh, as well as Susan and, you know, the rest of the Green Mountain Care Board staff for really being in the trenches with us trying to figure this out um, uh, and work our way through uh, how this model should work and, and is supposed to work. So uh, I would envision today as it really is a dialogue and there may be some things that we need to put in a parking lot lot for more discussion between us and your staff or with the board. Uh, we're going to do our best to sort of explain the way we were thinking about uh, how next year ought to work and in, uh, uh, in our budget with your uh, regulatory uh, levers uh, and review criteria in mind. Um, you know, certainly uh, we're here to answer any questions that, uh, uh, that you have as we move through this. The other part of, of the introduction is that, you know, a budget is just a plan. Um, and you know, I urge you to you know view this budget the way you might in, envision a hospital budget. Uh, that there's certain parameters that you need to have. You need to understand what our plan is. Uh, you do need to ask us to come back uh, next year during the year to say how are we doing against the plan and are we implementing it as as we said we would. But a lot of this is very dynamic, and we don't know until after you know the new year who's really the attributed lives and what some of the actuarial models end up being for the actual accountability that we have. Uh, and that's just part of what happens here. Uh, and certainly in that OneCare holds different contracts with directly with Medicare, but with a lot of standing by the board to set those parameters, but also a completely independent contract with Medicaid and with commercial carriers, uh, you know, that this regulated but yet individual contracts held by OneCare uh, with the different payers and programs you know, is part of what we're all trying to figure out is how do we, you know, build in the appropriate flexibility uh, uh, within a budget um, uh, to anticipate the fact that things do change. So I really appreciate the board's flexibility uh, and, and respect last year in getting to a point that we could get this thing launched. Uh, and I would hope that we'd have a similar similar approach heading in uh, to this to this cycle. So with that introduction, I think we're ready to get into the PowerPoint. Okay, um, last year I gave you a checkbox list of you know what was in the budget as, as the big headlines. I'm gonna do that again this year. Uh, I think we've got a great story for more progress in all-payer model uh, in, in terms of an expanded provider network, uh, expanded payers, uh, expanded attribution, uh, and you know really fulfilling uh, in our plan uh, what an all-payer model ought to be, which is including populations for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, employer-based plans, and, and insured plans uh, on our qualified health plan exchange change. 
you know, we are continuing down the pathway of expanding hospital payment reform of the kind that we've set precedent for, and, and often, you know, I think that story gets missed of, of, you know, we're doing the most advanced hospital payment reform, real payment reform uh, in the country uh, with the fixed perspective payment for Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, continued physician and community uh, investment and payment reform. Uh, we're building, we're maintaining and even building on uh, the great models that we've got in place now, and you're going to hear uh, a lot about that story uh, here today. Uh, and advancing population health management. Uh, you'll hear from, from Sarah uh, Barry, uh, you know, how we continue to uh, fulfill the promise of having a plan for every patient uh, as part of this. Uh, uh, yeah, that's in an effort to do well under the economic model, but it's really the right thing to do to have a more coordinated system and a more proactive system that keeps people healthy uh, rather than uh, only treat them when they're sick. So you're going to hear about all these things uh, here over the next hour from, uh, from my team. Um, I did include a slide that I've used a couple of times in uh, other presentations for those to, to explain what's in a ACO budget uh, in Vermont under an all-payer model and with the Greenmount Care Board oversight. This slide, oddly enough, looks way more complex and busy than it is, and I'm usually just the opposite. Uh, uh, so really, at the end of the day, what's in the budget are those two blue boxes, which is, you know, what is our total cost of care targets uh, for the attributed population that we have? Um, and what is our infrastructure and investments and payment reform uh, elements that, that we're funding outside of that, uh, including the operations of OneCare. And what you're going to hear from, from Tom uh, is uh, $851 million for our, our projected uh, spend for the attributed lives next year um, across all payer programs. Uh, $53 million in payment reform, community investment, uh, and infrastructure to support the model. Uh, you're going to hear about out of the $53 million uh, of that investment, that it's about $29 million coming from hospitals uh, and $26 million coming from payers in the state of Vermont through a variety of, of methods. Uh, and that is one question I often get asked. Um, and those monies fund the things that are down in the lower right, which is you know some of the great things that maintain the blueprint payments, uh, support community health teams, uh, uh, do you know real payment reform uh, uh, for physicians, uh, bring in community-based organizations and designated agencies, and, and support communities and in, in innovations uh, uh, and all the infrastructure to uh, to administer it. So, Todd. On yep. the, um, you're saying that of the 53 million, you've got 29 to 26, which adds up to 55. What am I missing? Oh, good question. What, what, what number is wrong, Tom? It's probably just a rounding thing. Uh, we'll, we'll look at it as we get deeper in and have more of the detail. Thanks. On the left in the yellow box uh, is the risk. And that is the one thing that sort of is this unique factor, is our budget pretty much projects what we think is really going to happen uh, from an actuarial predictability standpoint to our best ability to predict actuarial outcomes, which isn't that easy. So at the end of the day, on top of everything else, you will hear about you know, what is our uh, uh, projection against that target, but also you know, what is the maximum risk or reward that we could get uh, under these programs. Um, and uh, that's on total cost of care and the risk-bearing entities in this model again for next year are the hospitals participating in one care, bearing risk for all local attributed lives, uh, whether they uh, employ the primary care that attributed those lives or not. For our payment reform, the way our programs work is the payers uh, in programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial carriers, still pay fee-for-service for most providers, whether they're in the network or outside of the network or even outside of Vermont. It's really a short list of providers that we at OneCare actually get access to funds from the premium for us to make the payments to the providers and implement the reform. And it's really only two types of providers. One, the hospitals in the network under the uh, hospital payment reform model of, of the fixed perspective payment uh, that I talked about a minute ago. And the independent primary care practices who participate in our CPR, comprehensive payment reform model, where they get a monthly blended capitation across a payer program. 
programs. Uh, so we are going to see, we had three in the CPR program this year. We're going to uh, expand that uh, uh, to, I believe, five next year. Uh, and the hospitals will continue to uh, all be operating for Medicare and Medicaid under uh, the fixed perspective payment program. So that, in a nutshell, really sort of shows you what you're going to hear about over the next hour uh, and gives you a feel for, for how this works. All right. So my job today is really just to guide you through the whole One Care budget model, how it comes together. Uh, I have a strategy that hopefully will work well for doing that. Uh, there's a lot of content here. I'm going to try to go through uh, quickly enough to, to be mindful of our one hour time. But if there's something I'm saying that just doesn't compute, please, please stop me and, and we'll uh, circle back. But just to start, we're going to hit some high-level overview points that are really the basis of everything that will follow. And first things first are the payer programs that are included in the 2019 budget model. Starting with Medicare, this will be the second year of a Medicare risk program. Interesting note here is that we're moving from a modified next generation program in 2018 to a, a brand new Medicare program called the Vermont Medicare ACO Initiative. Medicare has a number of different program offerings along a spectrum of reform and progression. This is a brand new one that Medicare is offering and we're uh, modeling us as being an N of one in this new program. Medicaid, this will be the third year of a risk program with Medicaid and is becoming a very nice, stable program for One Care. Every year that we're in this uh, becomes easier and easier and, and uh, I can attest to that personally. Also including a Blue Cross Blue Shield QHP program for risk program for the second year to add that continuity to the network and the program offerings. And we also are modeling a continued uh, pilot with the University of Vermont Medical Center to include their self-funded plan uh, in our model. The last section here is a self-funded expansion. This is an area of opportunity and growth for One Care. And we're intending to grow in two different ways in the budget. One is to build upon the UVM uh, employer plan model and, and roll in other employer plans into the programs. And the second approach that we're taking is to work through plan administrators to bring in a larger book of their business uh, under one contract with one care. This has some efficiency in that we have one relationship with a, uh, a plan administrator and can bring in multiple employers with one uh, swoop. The next slide shows our year-to-year -year network participation growth by community. You'll see in 2017 our four original Vermont Medicaid next generation participants uh, and then growing substantially into 2018 and then continued growth into 2019. The two notes here to make are that we have two communities that are moving from the Medicaid only on-ramp to a participant in all three risk programs, which is a very positive sign. Uh, we're definitely trying to continue to move these communities into all risk programs for the scale and for the continuity of value-based care in their, in their community. We also have three brand new communities entering the model in 2019. That is Rutland, St. Johnsbury, and Randolph. They are participating in the Medicaid only option. This has proven to be a successful uh, strategy to on-ramp communities, get a little bit of comfort in the Medicaid program, and then hopefully transition them to all risk programs in 2020. One other note here is North Country is staying as a Medicaid uh, only HSA for this year, and that's due in large part to a recent leadership change. I like this slide to really just show visually the different provider types that make up our network. We speak a lot about the hospitals, but there is really a wide array of providers that participate in our uh, programs. The first three categories, the hospitals, FQHC, and independent primary care is really where our attribution comes from. But you can also see from all the remaining columns that there's a number of other provider types that don't specifically attribute to the model, but are integral to our health systems and important to keep in our model. All right, attribution estimates. We have this broken down by payer category. So starting with Medicare, uh, modeling an anticipated 47,000 uh, attributed lives, that's up about 10,000 from the current year starting point. 
Medicaid, we have just shy of 67,000. A lot of growth in those new communities that are coming on, the Rutland, St. Johnsbury, uh, and uh, Randolph HSAs. Blue Cross QHPs, anticipating starting the year about 22,500. Uh, we'll see all of these, we'll see where they land when the initial attribution runs, uh, when they come through. And then self-funded, this is the, really the biggest area of growth, uh, is up at just shy of 36,000 lives, and that includes the expansion of the UVM pilot to other plans and the other model that I spoke about where we're working with a, uh, a TPA, a third-party administrator, uh, essentially to bring lives into the program. When I think about the attribution list and what, what this is for it means, it helps all the calculations downstream, so it's a basis for calculating the total cost of care numbers that we'll have and the PHM, population health management receipts that are expected from the different providers uh, in the network. And ultimately, these attribution runs happen in December or into actually 2019 when the final numbers come in, but we use our modeling data and the best available data we have to, to build our expected attribution numbers. So to round this first section out a little bit, we have our network development strategy. Uh, really the summer months are when we engage with uh, prospective new participants in the network and develop our idea and, and strategy for how we uh, get more and more participation and expand this statewide model. Really in this year, uh, we, we focused on the FQHC participation, we focused on getting the HSAs that did not participate in 2018 into the model. Uh, I'm, I'm relatively pleased with the way that that all went. And I think our vision looking forward is to round out HSA participation so that we have all the Vermont communities in, in some sort of a program help to transition HSAs that are in the Medicaid only path into all three risk programs or four risk programs if you include self-funded. And then also developing our programs to uh, look at how we integrate, better integrate specialists and mental health providers into our clinical models so that we're adding value across the full spectrum of providers. All right, budget breakdown. My approach to this is going to be to follow the income statement. So for those who have our budget submission, uh, if memory serves me well, it's Appendix 4.2. And that has really uh, our illustrative income statement for one care, uh, different revenue streams that we have, and, and I'll use revenue in the term quotes, I'll explain that a little bit later, and then the different expenses that flow through one care. So I'm going to go section by section and speak to each about what's our philosophy and approach and how we have come up with the numbers uh, we're presenting today. So the first section is in the, in the revenue block, and these are the total cost of care targets. So this is going to reference back to that $851 million number that Todd referenced on the very beginning of the presentation. These are the targets of accountability. This is the spend expectation for each of these programs, and I'll explain how we come up with each of these now. So just to, to baseline on the general approach, our philosophy is to project the total cost of care targets in a manner that is either and or actuarially sound using the best data we have and also connects in any ties to contracts and the big example is the Vermont all-payer model which dictates some of the Medicare components. So we're, we're trying to uh, use a little bit of the best of both or the most appropriate to come up with our best guess for these total cost of care targets. These, these numbers are important because they ultimately drive uh, what the downside risk or upside potential is for each of the hospitals. So we, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we're doing the best we can to project these. But I will note that ultimately, in particular for the Medicaid and Blue Cross and the self-funded programs, they're negotiated between one care and the payer. Those negotiations are ongoing. So the, the numbers in here are our best estimate of where we think these targets will land. So I'll start with Medicare. Medicare is an interesting one in that the Vermont all-payer model really dictates the methodology and the, and the Green Mountain Care Board, the methodology that is applied to come up with what the 2019 expected benchmark or target will be. We are modeling our expected benchmark uh, in a manner that we believe is faithful to uh, the model in the all-payer model agreement, which takes 
the current year, which is 2018 spend, and trends that forward using a, a trend rate per the Vermont all pair model that happens to be 3.8% in this trend model and carries forward any expected shared savings from, from 2018 year into the 2019 year. That's the methodology by which we keep that connection back to year zero of the Vermont all payer model. Um, the, we do have some anticipated shared savings carryover. That is in part due to the conservatism that was built into our 2018 target so that we could continue funding some of the blueprint programs in the state. As we look at the trend chart here, I do want to point out some interesting things. Uh, early on, the green line that you'll see is our actual spend. And just, just as a note here, this is going to be a mix of shared savings results and a mix of all pair model results with some slightly different networks. So there's some noise in it, but I think the, the messaging is still important. The shared savings calculations of benchmark never really worked that well for our state. There are both national and regional adjusters that resulted in benchmarks that were uh, well below what we expected to see for spend. The Vermont all pair model uh, provides a much better basis for setting a benchmark. It uses a much more current base. Shared savings actually looked all the way back to 2014, whereas the Vermont all pair model uses the previous year and is based on our actual network and their actual spend. So the basis upon which the target is built is much more relevant to our economics. And you can see that increase that we're seeing in the gray line from 2017 to 18 and then 18 to 19 is much more reflective of our expected spend in the state. Without some of these modifications, it's questionable whether or not we could enter, you know, reasonably justifiably enter into a risk program. Of so the 17 to 18 includes both the 3.5% floor growth rate and the blueprint conservatism. So that wasn't included in the base in 17 on this particular graph. So that was the basis of that uh, big increase there. All right, next we have Medicaid. Again, Medicaid is a negotiated program. And we really have a more stable date, uh, base of data upon which to build these targets, which adds confidence, um, certainly to our model. And we're using the 17 spend and very conservative trends that are yet to be negotiated with uh, DIVA to come up with what we think the expected 2019 benchmark would be. Um, Right now, we're using a half percent uh, for that from the 2018 and 19 uh, mark. We do incorporate, because we've been in this program for a couple of years, we do incorporate our actual current year performance. It's relevant, important data. We also get modeling data from uh, Medicaid, and we do our best to blend these and come up with, a, with targets that are as reasonable as we can uh, get them to be. This program, just like the Medicare program, includes that 0.2% zero, uh, 0 discount factor built in. Next we have our Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield Vermont QHP total cost of care target. We are generating this target by using the 2017 spend, and we're doing this all based on allowed amount, and projecting that forward using trend rates per the Blue Cross Green Mountain Care Board approved filing. And that is how we get from our 2017 spend number up to the 2019 projection. Uh, we're in negotiations with Blue Cross to really finalize both the methodology and what the, the real number will be. Uh, this right here represents our best estimate of a fair approach to get to a 19 benchmark and ultimately will be determined in collaboration with Blue Cross. Just to go into the Blue Cross trend rate a little bit deeper, as it's, it's an interesting one and, and a little bit more nuanced perhaps than some of the others, is we build the trend off of the Green Mountain Care Board approved rate filings, but really are zeroing in on the factors that affect claims cost. And some of the factors that affect premiums don't necessarily translate directly down to the expected claim spend, so we try to zero in the best we can on the factors that really would affect the fee-for-service equivalent value uh, of the care for our attributed lives. Uh, one, one factor that we do have built in here is a 2.3% adjustment for the AHP Association Health Plan transition that came up in the negotiation or the trend rate filing with Blue Cross. Uh, we deem it to be reasonable and 
that type of migration of healthier patients from the QHP market to an association health plan market can increase the costs on a PMPM -PM basis. And these are the type of factors that we're looking at when determining what's a fair benchmark for the ACO. We're excluding any factors in the drug rate filing that are related to non-claims components such as administrative costs or building of reserves for Blue Cross or any other uh, Blue Cross uh, tax or fee impact adjustments. Next, we have our self-funded total cost of care. Data are limited for this programming. We're building this model largely based on the current self-funded model that we have but we will be hopefully bringing in new plans and also a plan with a, uh, a third party administrator that will affect these, but just to put in a, a placeholder of what the expected spend might be, showing some trends here. Uh, really, there's a lot of opportunity in terms of scale to grab more and more uh, self-funded, so it's an area we focus on a lot and, and want to continue to work on it uh, more and find more employer plans and more uh, plan administrators who want to participate with us in these models. All right, slide 20, uh, for those on the phone, Jack, one. Um, we have the estimated total cost of care targets in aggregate. This slide isn't intended to show trend rates, but really the scope of claims cost that is now within our accountability at one care we're moving from a projected total cost of care, and I say projection because it is based on attribution and attrition that we may experience. We expected 2018 total cost of care of 635 million, moving to 851 million. So that's an additional 34% accountability in the one care model, or 215,000. So it's a substantial increase, uh, certainly in my view. Uh, to, to the, the spend for Vermont period and lives that is now in a value-based program. All right, so we just talked about gross dollars, a 34% increase now. This slide is intended to boil that down into a blended trend rate. So the one of the interesting nuances of looking at our numbers for this year is we have a change in the payer mix. We're seeing more growth in the Medicaid programs as we brought in new communities in the Medicaid-only uh, arena. And Medicaid happens to have the lowest PMPM, so on a, a pure total dollars uh, standpoint, on a PMPM basis, our blended rate actually went down. Um, that's actually not the case, but it appears that way when you add in more Medicaid lives as opposed to more Medicaid lives. This exhibit quiets the payer mix noise. It takes the PMPMs from 17, 18, and 19 and applies the payer mix, attribution mix by payer, it, that we had in 2019 and applies that backwards so that mix in payer is not affecting the overall PMPM that we're seeing here. When we do that and take our 20, 17, 18, and 19 PMPMs with this standardized payer mix, uh, we're seeing a 1.9% blended increase from 2018 to 2019. This is encouraging to us uh, in that we're, based on this methodology, living within the 3.5% target as set by the all-payer model. Out of curiosity, we also took the uh, the statewide payer mix and applied our uh, PMPM rates from 2018 and 2019 just to see if that yielded a different result. When we did that, it uh, came up to a 3.0% blended trend rate from 18 to 19. So even if our PMPMs were applied statewide, if every life was in a one care program, this model would have us living within our 3.5% trend rate goal. All right, next section of the budget will speak about the other revenues that OneCare has. So the total cost of care targets are really our benchmarks. These other revenues are what help us sustain operations at OneCare. So this is that next section of the income statement. So really three different buckets of uh, revenue sources. We have our payer partners who contribute. We have the state of Vermont who contributes as well, and then the hospitals. 
The payer partners contribute in the form of PMPMs. So for every contributed life, there's a, a cash inflow to the one care network that helps us fund our operational management programming and operations in, in some cases. The state of Vermont supplies funding uh, for the advanced care coordination program, the HF Health Information Technology Informatics platform, and primary prevention programs. And then lastly, uh, certainly not least, is the hospitals whose participation fees round out the revenue needed by OneCare to really uh, facilitate these programs and the reforms. So that was the revenue section of the income statement. So this next uh, component will shift into the expense section. And I'm gonna start with the health services spending. <coughs> So before we were projecting what are the total cost of care targets or benchmarks going to be, now we're trying to project what's the spend going to be. In some cases, those are the same for the, for the Blue Cross and uh, Medicaid and self-funded. We're expecting whatever we negotiate with those payers to be our best guess of what the actual spending will be. Medicare is a little bit different and that some of the uh, terms of the all-payer model mean that the target could be different than our expected spending. But our general approach in calculating the expected spend is really an HSA up model, where we take an HSA base year PMPM, and everything is built on a PMPM up. We apply the program trend rate, this is the trend that we expect to see this next year, to come up with the 2019 expected HSA PMPM. That is multiplied by attribution, expected attribution, and that's really the HSA total cost of care. We do this collectively for each HSA. This is important. It's important to do it this way because the, the base PMPM for each HSA, HSA is not the same. We have one global target, might be $250 per member per month for the total Medicaid program, but some HSAs are higher or lower depending on the risk of their population, social determinant factors, the efficiency of the care delivery. So we build it from that uh, HSA level up to come to a total cost of care. When doing that, we, we aggregate up to this slide here, which is the total expected spend. Uh, this then we, will, we break that down to a combined PMPM for each payer program. So this is where the, the differences in each payer program's PMPM becomes quite evident. Medicaid is $249 is modeled here. Medicare $841. So as you add all the Medicaid lives, that's why the, the blended PMPM would just go down. Uh, in absence of any payer mix adjustment. So really, again, a big number in terms of the total spend that uh, we're expecting for our attributed lives uh, or net team. When we think about the spend, at least at the ACM, we start to break it down a little bit into a couple different uh, views and perspectives. Each HSA has a total spend number, but that spend happens in various settings and various, various proportions. So this next slide here shows in the dark green for the locally attributed lives, so the lives attributed to each of the HSAs, how much of the care is delivered at their home hospital under the fixed payment model, how much is delivered at a different one care hospital under fixed payments, this could be a referral to a different uh, hospital. The gray section is a, a, a non, uh, fixed payment hospital, but within our network, so that could be Copley or um, Grace Cottage or Dartmouth as a fee-for-service payer. And then the last is remaining fee-for-service. That is basically anything else, but it could be a local primary care doctor that's accepting a, a fee-for-service payment mechanism. It could be an FQHC. It could be an out-of-state provider that is just reimbursed on a fee-for-service basis. As we think about the long-term evolution of this, the no two HSAs are identical. Some have a lot more care that's delivered locally at home, some refer out more, and, and you can be mindful of that as we develop our uh, risk models going, going down the stream. This next slide takes a slightly different view and really looks at hospital spending across our network on a PM-PM basis. 
Uh, I, I think it's an interesting way to start looking at some of the, the hospital spend numbers. But we're taking the hospital spend and dividing it up by our total one care attribution to come up with just a relative uh, amount of hospital care that each of these providers are, are delivering. I think that this will be an interesting one to look at over time with some year to year trending to see are there any uh, movements in these PMPMs. And it also is broken down uh, the top section here into two different categories. One is for the, the hospital care that they deliver for their local lives. The green is for lives that are referred into their hospital from a different attributing community. The, the bottom graph here is a stack of bars that shows the proportion of spend related to their local lives versus those being referred in. There's some pretty interesting trends to this. I find that geography often affects this quite a bit. For example, SVMC, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, down in Bennington, um, really doesn't refer to a lot of other Vermont hospitals very often, uh, just because of their, their geography and, and their uh, capacity down there in Bennington. So this naturally segues into the fixed payment model. This is also a part of that section uh, on the income statement of health services spending. The fixed payments represent an important shift away from fee for service. Uh, really start thinking about healthcare delivery in a, in a different way, capitated way. And the 2019 budget model incorporates fixed payments for the Medicaid and Medicare programs. So the same uh, fixed payment approach that we have in 2018. These fixed payments work a little bit differently. The Medicaid fixed payment is viewed as the true total cost of care. I mean, that fixed payment is, is what we're agreeing to with, with Medicaid is the actual spend amount for these uh, attributed lives. And it's not subject to any reconciliation at your end. Medicare works a little bit differently. They view the fixed payment as really a cash advance and the network earns that back as they do uh, provide care to the attributed patients that have those zero pay shadow claims, we call them. That really is reconciled at the end of the year. So if Medicare were to overpay us for the fixed payments, we owe that back to them. If they underpay, uh, underpay us, then they would actually make good on that. That is really a subcomponent under the program and the full settlement. The settlement is still based on the benchmark that we have for Medicare and the fee-for-service equivalent of all care underneath it. So they'll take those the value of those zero paid claims plus actual fee-for-service paid to do the settlements. Just a nuance that I think is important to understand for the fixed payment model. Another important note actually I'll just make really quickly is that the amount that any hospital receives is the payment to cover care for not only their localized but any of the referrals in. So that's a component that we look at. How much of the fixed payment was for their, their local population? How much was referred in from other communities in 2018? We reconcile that latter piece to protect against any market shifts that we might experience. Slide 30 provides a breakdown of the fixed payments in terms of the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Here's the gross dollars just to get a, a feel for how much money there actually is flowing through one care to uh, the hospitals. And then breaks it also down by PMPM using two different methodologies. One is based on total attribution, one is based on their HSA attribution. Really, the, the number that I think is important to know is that 25% of the total cost of care is flowing through a fixed payment model, uh, which is a, a, good, a good solid number, but one that we'd like to see increase uh, downstream. <clears throat> Funds flow is a question that we received often, and really it remains unchanged in 2018, but to make sure that it's understood, there's really two avenues here. At, at the top, we have the payers. Uh, so this is Medicaid, Medicare, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Vermont, and self-funded plans. And there's a, a, an early split that is either paid fee-for-service claims, so this is for a non-hospital provider or a non comprehensive payment reform uh, pilot, independent primary care provider, where the provider submits a claim and the payer pays that claim according to their own fee schedule and their own adjudication process. One care never actually touches those dollars. Uh, 
uh, that, that's the case for acute MCs, any non-CPR primary care, any other continuum care providers, that, uh, whether they're in our network or out of our network. The other way in which funds flow is that the payers pay one care monthly uh, for the fixed payment allocation, so the amount that we agreed upon with the payer to cover the hospital fixed payments and the CPR fixed payments, and then any of the payer investments in population health management. From there, every month, OneCare makes payments to the participating network providers and pays out according to these three boxes uh, and, our, and our payment approaches. For the leftmost box, the hospitals and CPRs can include their fixed payments, uh, any other population health management payments that they're eligible to receive, care coordination payments, the value-based incentive fund payment, which happens at the conclusion of the plan year, and then any other payments uh, related to reform efforts uh, such as our specialist reform um, pilot program that we're working on now. The other attributing practices receive basically all the same with the exception of the fixed payments. And then the non-attributing practices are really uh, zeroing in on the care coordination funds and their participation in that program, the value-based incentive fund. And if they have any involvement, in any, if they're specialists, for example, they'd be eligible to receive any funds uh, for that program. So next we're gonna get into our population health management spending and because uh, this is really a, all of our clinical initiatives and the investments we're making in our community, we're gonna have Sarah speak Oops. Good afternoon. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, the $37 million worth of investments that we're looking to make in our communities over the course of 2019 and describe some of the programs and their expansion as well as some new programs that we're looking to implement. So as we look to the programs that really were set in the foundational year with Medicaid in 2017, in 2018 we've been expanding those to our other payer programs as well. With our population health management uh, program, we are currently funding $3.25 per member per month into all of our primary care practices based on their attribution. What we've been revising and um, really updating in this program over the course of the summer months is to clarify the expectations and the accountabilities associated with ongoing receipt of that funding. And so each of our practices over the course of the last three months has gone through an attestation process to um, make sure that we are all clear on the key criteria for these funds and how they're applied. And you can see in a synopsis level those criteria on the screen. They include making sure that you're using data effectively to evaluate the care that you're providing, um, having activities in place to address gaps in care, working on uh, the accuracy of the coding to make sure that we understand the risk profiles of the population panels that you're caring for, as well as maintaining and continuing to advance the team-based care concepts that the Blueprint has done so much to put in place over the last decade. In the second investment, uh, we are continuing to expand our complex care coordination program in 2019. We're anticipating this to be in the range of $9 million. The entirety of that funding comes through OneCare and is sent out into our network to support our person-centered, community-based approach to care coordination. One of the new things that we're anticipating being able to support in our care coordination program in 2019 is a partnership with the health department and some local parent-child centers in a program called DELSE, which is really looking at how we can address social determinants of health and early childhood development to create strength-based programs and really advance care for that um, potentially vulnerable time in a, a young child's life. In the third area, we have continued to expand our value-based incentive fund. So this was a pilot program in the Medicaid for communities in 2017 that has advanced into all of our payer programs in 2018. And we're anticipating not only continuing that in 2019, but we've also been working through a primary care work group to implement and test over the course of 2019 some variable models for how the funds would actually be allocated based on what is earned at the level of the ACO. And so we're looking forward to the opportunity to evaluate that and continue to refine it in 2019. 
Tom spoke just a, a moment ago about our comprehensive payment reform program. This program was a pilot in 2018 with three independent primary care organizations, and we're very excited that that is expanding on a voluntary basis to nine organizations over the course of 2019. As part of that, they are receiving uh, funding in a new and, and um, different way, something that they need to get used to, and they're also investing time and, and energy and resources and really thinking about how care can be provided in different and new ways. We've been obtaining tremendous feedback from providers and continuing to reform that program as we look toward 2019. In the area of specialists, uh, we are very committed to implementing a pilot program in 2019 and are really looking at two key drivers, uh, the first around improving access to care and the second around quality of care. And so looking for the right levers and opportunities, both from payment and care delivery, to think about how we can uh, better align and support the integration of primary care and specialty care providers to make sure that the patients that are um, sickest or most vulnerable are able to access specialty care services in a timely manner and return back to their primary care providers as appropriate. In the area of primary prevention, we continue to um, support the Rise Vermont initiative, which has been tremendously successful in getting off the ground in 20 communities over the course of 2018. And we're anticipating that that will expand to an additional 14 communities in, over the course, excuse me, of 2019. That program has had uh, a tremendous local success in engaging program coordinators in at least six of the health service areas to be able to identify what the areas of opportunity are and address programs that with small funding and creativity and community engagement really can make a difference in promoting health and well-being. In order to support our programs um, and really make sure that we are able to learn from the local variation as well as the, the wonderful work that is happening from one end of the state to the other, One Care invests funding in regional clinical representatives. These are individuals that uh, provide really peer-to-peer -peer coaching. They serve as local champions for the work that's happening. Uh, they share data and information from One Care Centrally into their community as well as bring uh, information back about successes and lessons learned. And so all of those regional clinical representatives also serve on our Clinical and Quality Advisory Committee, providing that bi-directional communication that we're finding to be so effective. One of the brand new areas that I'm particularly excited about uh, for 2019 is an innovation fund. And One Care is looking to invest a million dollars in 2019 in local communities to be able to test and evaluate innovative projects that have the potential from day one to be scalable uh, to other communities and statewide. And so this is a program that we anticipate running through our Population Health Strategy Committee, which is a, a quite a diverse group of uh, providers, continuum of care representatives, and um, individuals that are very much dedicated to helping make sure that One Care is able to advance its mission towards accomplishing the triple aim. <coughs> These next three programs and investments are really about continuing the blueprint for health investments uh, from the Medicare program. So regarding the primary, uh, the patient-centered medical home payments as well as the community health team payments, um, we are anticipating and we're actively working with blueprint staff right now to refresh the Medicare attribution, which has been held constant uh, for quite a period of time. And what we're anticipating in that process is that there actually will be an increase in the blueprint Medicare attribution that we will want to account for. For the SASH payments, um, we are anticipating a direct contract between OneCare and SASH to help support the alignment with our overall care model and are looking forward to continuing that partnership. We are anticipating fully funding all of the existing SASH panels. Um, as well as continuing the contributions for both ACO and non-ACO participating uh, practices and community health teams. All right, so next we're on to the operating costs, which is the last section of the income statement for one care. 
This slide shows a summary of the 2018 budget to 2019 budget and the change areas that we're seeing. So we're moving from 12 and a half million up to uh, just shy of 16 million. Bigger changes happen in the staffing area. I'll speak to those in a minute. Contracted services going up, and actually, just to back up one one step further, one of the reasons we're experiencing some operating cost increases is that Rise Vermont is really on ramping into one care operations. Last year, it was viewed as a population health investment, and all of their costs were in that PHM category. They're becoming such an integral part of one care that their salaries and a lot of the expenses that they have as, as an organization are now rolling into our one year operating costs. So that's one of the reasons for the changes. So that's gonna be a contributing factor for the salaries, for the contracted services, the investments that they make in um, to build that Rise Vermont program and expand it state, statewide are included in that contracted services line. We're also seeing uh, increased costs in the categories of actuarial services and legal as we expand our network and have more uh, need to do data analysis and expanding payer programs that all require analysis and growth there as well. Um, the other expense category that's showing some increase is travel as we have a more statewide network. We have to spend more time on the road. And then the other expenses is growing uh, in large part to the Greenmont Care Board bill back. On the staffing changes, uh, really it's kind of a widespread, small, incremental growth approach. Uh, we did put a lot of time and energy into looking at the staffing model we had, reacting to the needs of the network, and making sure we had the right uh, people. Uh, in the right positions to meet the needs of our network. Uh, the, so there's really 7.1 FTEs that are related to One Care operations. The bottom section here is four of those rising up positions that are now on ramping into One Care, and then there are two positions that are uh, in the budget to do specific work on mental health and opioid use disorder projects. All right, reserves, and this happens to be the answer to the very first question we were asked by Tom Mullen, which is what was the difference between those two numbers that are perceived? The answer is the reserve calculation. So the 2019 budget model has a $2.8 million operating gain. Uh, this is the means by which one care can develop reserves. As a reminder, there are uh, there's a budget order in the 2018 program year to have $2.2 million of reserve built by the end of this year. We intend to, in this budget model, add 2.8 to that to have a $5 million reserve. These reserves uh, are becoming an important component for One Care. And, uh, it's taken some thought to get to this point, but and one of the uh, findings, results of our network development strategy this year is that the, the downside risk is a big deal for some of the smaller hospitals and their balance sheets. Having some reserves that One Care can be a useful strategy to help bringing more in, especially when we start getting into the Medicare program. So that, that's one reason having some resources that one care makes sense for our network development. One of the concerns raised last year was the issue of default risk. If a hospital were just to not pay uh, a, a downside risk payment, how would one care protect itself and its solvency? And, and an answer to that is to having some reasonable reserves. The other is just regular cash flow. Uh, we're a, a growing business, and the amount of dollars that flow through One Care are, are growing as our network grows and our programs grow. And having some, having a balance sheet to rely upon to cover timing issues with any payments that come from the payers or from the network um, is an important uh, aspect. And the last point we make here is that we would like to see this scale proportionally with our overall network growth. The one other note I'll add is that any reserves that One Care builds or intends to build should be considered in context of other payer program requirements. Medicare, for example, has a reserve requirement uh, that comes along with being in the, the next generation or Vermont ACO initiative that was a substantial uh, amount of money. It was about $4.2 million that had to be secured to meet the program requirements of Medicare. So really, any reserve requests that uh, we ask be considered in context of other reserve requirements that may be in place. All right, next I want to talk about what this really means for the network and their commitment to this accountable care, value-based care approach. So really, OneCare 
as I think most of you know, is a, is a network of providers, and we're all coming together to, fur to further the components of the triple aim. Um, this really is a, a big task that takes both clinical and financial reforms working together to achieve these results. I think that if we just were to do financial reform and have no clinical investment, uh, we probably wouldn't achieve great results, and in many cases, the clinical reforms can't take place without changes to the financial incentives that are put in place in the financial model, so it's a very connected uh, model. To do this, to pull this off, takes really two things. One is accepting downside risk, which is the financial reform that flips the incentive structure so that a well population uh, doesn't damage the delivery system. And it takes investment in our programs, and those investments come from a number of places, and the payers contribute, uh, some other revenue streams, but the hospitals are also major players in investing in the model so that we can sustain and do well in the financial paradigm. So with that in mind, a little bit on risk and what's included in the budget model. This, this is, bearing that risk is really a requirement of these accountable care models, and as in, just like in 2018, each hospital will be supplied a maximum risk limit calculation that takes their HSA spend, spend for their HSA lives, and applies the program risk terms, the corridor and any share that may be in place, to their HSA spend and come up with a maximum risk limit. Technically, all of these programs settle at the ACO level, so one HSA could drive the entire risk corridor for the ACO, we don't want that to happen because that could uh, jeopardize the solvency of any one HSA. So we apply these maximum risk limits and the rules about how any uh, risk or reward above that limit is handled in the network as a real protection for all of the HSAs and the hospitals bearing the risk. What we have in here for risk corridor terms, and again, all these are subject to negotiation or, uh, and or in some cases decision by the One Care Board, Medicare will maintain the 5% risk <laughs> corridor, but transitioning from an 80% share to a 100% share, this decision is uh, supported by the fact that we anticipate having some shared savings because of the conservatism in the 2018 target for the blueprint. So essentially, if we were to hit our actual actuarial claims target right in the head in, in 2018, we're gonna owe back 20% of the conservatism that was given for blueprint. After the results that we're experiencing thus far, we think it, it is right to do away with the 80% sharing and make sure that we can carry forward as much shared savings as we can earn into the future years. Medicaid, moving from a 3% risk corridor to a 4% risk corridor. Uh, this is just consistent with the program evolution of Medicaid and taking measured steps uh, to move it forward and risk accountability <coughs> under the model. Blue Cross, Maintain the same risk model, which is a 6% corridor and 50% sharing within the corridor. And then self-funded, this is very premature, but we're, we're exploring some downside risk elements of the program, which would have a 6% corridor, but a 30% share. That 30% is meant to ensure that the lives of the tribute would qualify for scale targets under the Vermont all payment model. So this next slide builds upon everything discussed thus far, the estimated attribution, the estimated total cost of care, the model risk terms, and boils it down into estimated hospital risk. Uh, it's a big number, there's $34.8 million of, of downside risk or upside potential for these programs. Ultimately, the actual upside and downside risk is dependent on final attribution that we receive actual total cost of care targets that we negotiate and finalize with the payers. This is meant to represent our, our best estimate of all of that and help hospitals make decisions and their boards make decisions about whether or not uh, to participate and whether or not a year in which they had to pay up to the maximum risk limit would be uh, harmful to their organization. One other note on here, there are some risk uh, mitigation uh, Solutions that One Care has developed. Uh, there's a, a risk mitigation model for the Medicare program, and there are some risk mitigation arrangements with specific hospitals. These are not factored into these numbers. These are just the gross risk numbers. 
and essentially the check that one care we have to write back to these payers if we completely maxed out our downside. All right, so next we have our hospital participation costs. Um, these are really the the amount here, this 29 million, is the amount that we need from the hospitals to fulfill the one care budget model here. And we collect those either through fixed payment deduction when we're able with Medicaid and Medicare programs or quarterly invoice to the hospitals. Um, I really want to break the, this number down into a couple of different components. We have a gross deduction amount of 29 million. That's the amount that the hospitals are, are paying in uh, on monthly or quarterly installments to one care. That really funds two different components. One is the investment and population health management programs that comes right back to the hospitals. So they're, they're contributing to one care programs, but they're also recipients of those funds. So one could view the expected PHM receipts column to share 14 million as really a cash flow function. We're withholding the dollars at one care so that we can operate the programs that are ultimately paid right back to the hospital network. The amount remaining is really the net cost to the hospitals of one care. And this would be the amount that would essentially go away if they didn't participate at all. So that's 14.6 million. That can be broken down into really three categories here. One is community investment. So th these are investments where the hospitals are paying into help fund one care initiatives and payments are being made to other community providers, designated agencies, independent primary care, QHCs, et cetera, and really investing in population health for the other uh, community entities that are in our network. We also have that contribution to reserves number here, that's the 2.8 million I referenced before. And then the last is contribution to one care operations. Uh, the 7.8 million is really the amount that one care needs after factoring in all of the revenue streams that we can use to help fund our regular operating costs. So now I'd like to walk you through a couple of highlights related to our clinical and quality outcomes. We have spent tremendous time in the last couple of years talking to providers across our network as well as working with the Green Mountain Care Board staff and the healthcare advocates and really looking at the opportunities to align quality measures under the all-payer model. Uh, the latest work collaboratively in that has really been around aligning the Medicare quality measures that will go into effect for 2019. And the accomplishment there collectively is that over the course of the last two years, we've really been able to take a disparate set of more than 40 quality measures, many measures which did not align across more than one program, and bring them into alignment. And so you'll see here a set of 15 quality measures, uh, usually about 13 measures for any one payer program. The intense focus of these measures and the alignment under the all payer model really means a couple of key goals for us. It looks at effectively being able to reduce the administrative burden on primary care from having to um, develop systems and processes for oftentimes measures that had slightly different definitions and became very frustrating to try and uh, figure out how best to track. But also, it's really looking at measures that are clinically important. They're important to the overall health and well-being of Vermonters. And our providers feel very strongly that these represent a diverse set of measures that really allow them to set targets and goals to strive forward towards. Looking at our 2017 quality measure performance, uh, results became available recently. In our Medicaid program, again, of the four pilot communities, we achieved an 85% quality score overall. This was using a, a brand new set of measures for us. And uh, one of the key determinations related to our uh, ability to reinvest in quality is that our Population Health Strategy Committee and our Board of Managers approved uh, and worked collaboratively with DIVA on a reinvestment strategy for the component of the value-based incentive fund that was not successfully earned. So this was the 15% uh, that we did not achieve by uh, the quality score that we obtained. And so the plan that we have in place now and we'll be operationalizing over the next few weeks is to be able to send those funds 
out into the local communities in those four health service areas through the function of their community collaborative, also known as their accountable community for health, with some guidelines from One Care about areas of opportunity that align with gaps in care. And then for us to work with them around how to design specific programs and projects to address those gaps in care over the course of the next year. Within our Blue Cross Blue Shield program in 2017, this was a shared savings program. And you can see that we were able to uh, achieve 73% of our quality score and really maintain the overall quality across most measures. For Medicare, we achieved an 88% quality score. And one of the things that really was uh, changing for us in that shared savings program year is that six different quality measures that had been reporting measures became payment measures. And that did have an impact on our overall quality score, as well as the quality scores for other ACOs around the country. And so as you'll see in this next slide, uh, this is an opportunity for us to look at, under the Medicare Shared Savings Program, how does one care compare to all of the other ACOs uh, on two dimensions? Across the x-axis, we're looking at the cost per beneficiary per year, and on the y-axis, we're looking at that overall quality score. And if your eyes can search it out in that top left quadrant, you'll see a green dot, and that represents one care's performance relative to all of the other ACOs. We pay tremendous attention to this, and this for us is, is the high value quadrant. We always want to see that we're able to function and support Vermont and healthcare reform by really leveraging high quality care and controlling that cost growth. This is just a quick example of some of the types of activities that when we take a longitudinal view of our quality measures that we're able to see uh, some growth and some impact. And so this is a measure around adolescent wealth care. Looking in the left-hand chart at the Department Shield Qualified Health Plan program and on the right, the Medicaid program. The very colored uh, lines are really showing you the benchmarks by year, and the bars are showing what our actual quality performance is. And so you can see we're making incremental and, and steady progress, the most dramatic of which has really been in the last year in the Medicaid program as we were able to uh, really advance towards that 75th percentile. It's interesting to note that this quality measure nationally has stagnated for a long time. It's a very hard measure to move. I often spend quite a bit of time talking about our care coordination program, and so rather than walk you through the fundamentals of the model, I thought what I would take a couple of minutes to do is highlight some of the early results and then uh, share with you a case study, um, a, a real life example of the way that care is changing in our communities. So in this uh, chart, what we're really displaying here is that for um, all of our care programs, so regardless of which program uh, a participant is in, um, if they were successfully engaged in our care coordination program for uh, between one and six months, we're looking here at the utilization of emergency room visits. And what we're seeing is that um, with the beginning of the 2018 calendar year and the transition to these risk-based programs, that we're actually seeing a, a trend showing some decline in those emergency room visits. This is still an early signal. We have many other metrics that we're paying attention to and we'd be happy to describe. But these are the types of um, information that we're sharing across our communities as we start to look at the impact of this community-based care coordination program. So in this case study I'd like to share with you, uh, we're looking at a Medicaid member who was determined through our risk stratification program to be at very high risk. She's in her late 50s, she has extraordinary medical complexity, and so for the purpose of this case study, I'm going to call her Sally. Sally, over the course of the last 12 months, had a risk score about 14, um, which is extraordinarily high when you look at our population. Her spending was above $120,000 in the last year. She was admitted to the hospital seven times. Four of those times, the cause of her readmission was related to the initial diagnosis that she had had and she visited the emergency room six times. Sally has diabetes, she has uh, COPD, she has congestive heart failure, she's obese. In total, we've captured 28 different health conditions that put Sally at increased risk. Unfortunately, Sally's pattern was to spend one week at home, followed by roughly three weeks in the hospital, and that pattern was repeating itself over and over again. In August, Sally was identified 
um, as someone who could potentially benefit from enhanced care coordination services. She was outreached to from her primary care practice and uh, selected a nurse in that practice to serve as her lead care coordinator. Sally described herself as depressed, fearful, exhausted by her many admissions and all of the transfers, the documentation, and the details that she had to track. She was able to articulate that her goal primarily was to stay at home, but that the complexity of her illnesses made this particularly challenging, and it was recognized that without strong coordination across a number of service providers that that was unlikely to happen. Because of Sally's underlying conditions, um, as she was discharged in that last visit in August, she could not be admitted to a skilled facility because they didn't have the services uh, available to su supply the advanced needs she had for IV medication. So her hospital case management team worked to stabilize Sally. Um, they actually inserted a line to help her be able to get her medications. And they strove to really figure out how they could get home health to support her. The initial plan was that she could be at home, but she would have to travel to the hospital every day for her IV medications. And that in order to do that, someone would need to help arrange for specialty van transportation back and forth each day. And for a whole variety of reasons, that was a, a process that was likely to not result in the type of care that Sally really needed in order to be able to break the cycle of hospitalizations. So the local and the referral hospitals collaborated. Uh, they worked together through pharmacy and supply chain. They identified all of the equipment and the surgical supplies that Sally needed. Her lead care coordinator worked across all of those systems, uh, addressed her needs for specific prescriptions, identified barriers related to her out-of-pocket expenses, um, and helped support her and how to um, be able to, to obtain those medications. The care team identified medication complexity as a barrier and arranged for bubble packs, so somebody to actually count and aggregate medications so that it, there could be a process and a standardization about which medications, what time to take them, how to take them. That care team held multiple care conferences, both by home and, uh, excuse me, by phone and in the patient's home. It involved home health, the choices for care program, her nurse care coordinators, her neighbors, a diabetic educator, her husband, and pharmacy technicians. The lead care coordinator organized the team to care for the husband, also a patient in that practice, but one who's not attributed to the ACO. The husband was significantly older than Sally and was experiencing other social and economic challenges and was asking for help. The lead care coordinator identified existing social supports, many from her local neighborhood, um, as well as arranged for a plan for those neighbors to come in and support Sally and her husband with cooking, with caregiving, checking on them to make sure that they were okay on a daily basis, all together providing for a more stable home and emotional environment. The early signs indicate a significant reduction in Sally's utilization. She's now been at home for 11 weeks. She has not had any admissions or emergency room visits. She's successfully managing her complexity. She's weighing herself. She's managing her conditions. She's actually successfully completed several of the goals in her care plan and has now set new goals for herself. So I share this case study with you as an example of the type of transformative care that One Care is really trying to support and facilitate as we're aligning the care delivery system at the local level, as we're bringing together talented professionals across many organizations and working to break down the barriers, often um, systemic barriers, to providing optimal care. Before I finish up, I'd like to just touch briefly on our patient benefit enhancement waivers. Uh, you've heard me speak about these a bit before, uh, but two important notes that I wanted to bring forward today is that as we spent time meeting with both our current uh, network participants as well as those that were considering joining us over the course of the summer for 2019, one of the surprising things that I learned was that it was actually these patient benefit enhancement waivers that were a key driver in the decision making at the local level about uh, the, the potential impact and the way that it could be felt on a person level basis for transforming care. As we've implemented these waivers, I just was getting an update today for the skilled nursing facility waiver that allows an individual on Medicare to waive a three uh, overnight stay before being able to be transferred to a skilled nursing facility. 
That was first piloted in the Middlebury Health Service area, and they've now successfully admitted 18 patients through that uh, waiver. It spread into the St. Albans Health Service area. They've had their first several patients now admitted through that waiver. It's uh, active as well down in Brattleboro with their first patient. We've been continuing to train new communities. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing with this waiver um, is not whether patients are interested, is not whether this results in better care. It's about making sure that we have the skilled nursing facilities that have a quality level that allows us to be able to bring them into the network and um, utilize this waiver. And so really helping to support that program moving forward could be a, a next task for us. In terms of the two other waivers, um, they are in early stages of implementation. Uh, we are underway with SASH in a um, pilot program for the telehealth waiver uh, for residents in um, some of their settings and connections to their primary care providers. And then for the post-acute home discharge waiver, we're hoping to implement the first pilot program in November. Um, we have been challenged by some of the legal and contractual requirements that are necessary to be able to fully deploy this waiver in the way that works for our network. Um, in other ACOs around the country, it's tended to be done in a, a centralized fashion, maybe through a clinically integrated network. But we're really looking to build that partnership more strongly between our providers and our home health agencies. And so just working through the details of how to make that happen has taken us a little longer than we anticipated. Before I end, I wanted to touch briefly on uh, our population health management platform. This is really the, the sophisticated set of tools that we bring together and brand as WorkBench One. WorkBench One allows us to integrate data from multiple sources. We bring together our claims data, our clinical data feeds, both from our electronic medical records and our health information exchange. We bring in event notification data, something new to us in 2018, as well as our care management data. And all of this data come together and are accessed by an extraordinarily talented team of analysts and programmers who take that information, take that data, really the raw um, output, and are able to bring it together, turning that data into information that's actionable for both our monitoring as well as for driving change and improvement, whether that be at a statewide system level or at a local care delivery level. We also use this analytics platform to support our payer reporting and our regulatory requirements. We feed data to our clinical governance committees, as well as specific uh, local and statewide change e efforts. So that might be a learning collaborative at the local level, a statewide one that we are offering, such as our diabetes and pre-diabetes management learning collaborative. And we support local efforts, be that at the, the individual site level or across an accountable community for health. All right, thank you, Tom and Sarah. Good job. All right, so as we conclude our, our formal presentation, just a, a couple thoughts uh, to put this year's budget uh, in context for, for where this is going uh, uh, in all peer model. I think we're, you know, we've started something really good here in Toronto. People are really interested nationally to see how this is going to work, and, you know, we're all working really hard to, to make the model uh, right, but. Thoughts on ensuring success for the rest of the model after after this year. I, I just want to take a couple minutes. Uh, I, I would encourage us to focus on affordability as uh, having a true north, which is the all care model growth rate of 3.5%. Um, and you know, the way you gotta think about this is on a statewide level, having a model for what you think the different categories are gonna grow at, and then understanding what is one care's unique payer mix. Uh, and is the population even within uh, a payer uh, that we attribute higher or lower risk uh, than you know, the statewide average. That really gets complex, but it's really gonna be essential for us to agree on how we measure that growth rate and what one care subset of the state uh, accountability uh, that we have. Um, and you know, that, that's one that you, you certainly have me and my team's uh, uh, strongest uh, uh, dedication to, to work on. Uh, I know we all worry about affordability, and a lot of times it ends up being just focused on the commercial insured, uh, but this is an all-payer model, and we do have a definition of affordability uh, at the 3.5% growth rate level. We believe in our best ability to calculate it that if the entire state was in one year, we would be proposing a growth rate from 2018 to 2019 of 3.0%, so it does even leave a little room uh, and margin for error for the non-attributed lives. 
uh, and for final models and, and targets. Uh, you know, but I really urge you in your regulatory uh, models for uh, uh, the ACO under all pair model to use that 3.5% as your, as your true north uh, and regulatory guidance uh, uh, parameter. Uh, alignment of the regulatory oversight levers. I mean, this is one we've talked about together for years, which is, you know, uh, you as a regulatory body uh, are unique nationally in having a dial for hospital budgets, the largest chunk of spend in a healthcare delivery system uh, and under the total cost of care. You have traditional insurance department role in fully insured rate regulation. Uh, under the same hat, and then we've added the you know middle layer of uh, an accountable care organization, risk bearing model, taking risk from payers, uh, and then paying providers, and, and uh, delegating that accountability to live within our, our spending pattern. Um, you know, one of the things that that I think for the first time this year that there's going to be some some real you know conversations in terms of if we have something in our budget. Uh, that we think is consistent with the 3.5% growth rate and our expectations uh, from uh, the payers. Um, uh, and we negotiate that, uh, but yet the payers or the state budget for Medicaid uh, can't align with our 0.5% growth rate or, or uh, what our PMPM we might say we think is a fair target for a commercial uh, program uh, if that money isn't there or, or is misaligned somehow. Uh, you know, how, how we close that gap is going to be important, and you got to remember that as an ACO, we don't have reserves. We don't have an adverse risk adjuster to pay us next year if we end up with a riskier population than we set course for. It's a voluntary model, meaning that I've got to bring, before we sign contracts, to a board of providers that are at risk uh, a proposal and our best projection on whether we think we're going to do well under the model. And the higher probability that we bring them a target that we think might be what we call underwater from month one, meaning we really, really are not going to have a, shy, a chance at, at, at earning shared savings. We almost certainly earn shared losses. That's the real thing that we need to protect uh, against and really the one thing that you need to work with us on uh, if you really do care uh, for the all care model and its uh, sustainability and success. Uh, committed, flexible, and responsive payer partners. Uh, you know, certainly uh, trying to get this into the vision of all payer model that these are aligned models uh, in terms of levels of risk and you know, way that, ways that we can pay providers differently underneath uh, the population targets uh, and the fact that you know, there are expenses uh, uh, in implementing reform that were originally intended to be under uh, a lot of funding from the delivery system reform program that you know, hasn't really fully materialized. Uh, um, you know, we need payer partners who really believe in what we're doing are willing to invest in it with us even further, uh, especially as we scale this thing. And then finally, especially for hospitals, uh, you know, I gave you this information last year. The hospitals are really stepping forward in this model. We're gonna have 12 of the 14 in Vermont and the other two were very interested, but just for a variety of reasons, just weren't in a financial position to, uh, to assume the risk. Uh, but we have 12 hospitals in this model uh, in Vermont. We still have the originating, original founding partner of OneCare, Dartmouth Hitchcock, is uh, a very dedicated partner in this thing. Uh, between funding, you know, about half of the transformation uh, out of hospital dollars, uh, accepting the payment reform uh, for what happens in their own four walls and taking a fixed payment monthly to cover any services that they got to provide to our attributed lives. Uh, and in addition, taking the total cost of care risk which includes, for the first time against the hospital balance sheet under this program in Vermont, hospitals are taking accountability for claims spending for things that could happen a thousand miles away. And that's a brand new risk on hospital balance sheets that never existed before. It's one thing to say, we're flipping the access for your services that we are going to reward high volume in your hospital, and now we're going to reward uh, high value in your hospital. But on top of that, taking that extra risk on the total cost of care that's embedded in ACO models is a big deal. And especially as we scale the model, if you really believe that we're going to keep making progress on scale targets and need to make progress on scale targets, I think the hospitals are about tapped out under the existing models in what their balance sheets can, can bear. The $34 million of total risk that Tom talked about 
is getting to be such a substantial number that from here in 2020, if we're successful in additional scale, we have to have a really serious conversation in terms of do we want to build additional reserves in one care so that we can limit the 34 million maybe in a flat year to year basis? Do you want to allow hospitals that are taking that risk to have extra hospital budget uh, accommodations to build reserves so that I can give them more than $34 million worth of risk and not have it be, uh, and have it be uh, uh, safe risk and funded risk? That's gonna be the really most important discussion we're gonna have as we get to the second half uh, uh, in year three uh, of, of this all-payer model. Um, and those are the thoughts I want to leave you with. And at this point, I think we're done with our formal presentation and I'm glad to move on with the question uh, here. So thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Um, I'll start off with some of the questions. Uh, if you go back to the <coughs> slides, the network participation. So um, we know that it's a joint collaborative with Dartmouth and the UDL. And it appears that at least Dartmouth has told us that they can't participate on the Medicare population of Vermonters because they're participating in the next gen project in New Hampshire and that federal rules preclude them from participating in Vermont. I'm wondering if you've quantified the number of Medicare lives uh, from Vermont that comes up to and if there's any plan to try to figure out some way around the federal regulation. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to how many Vermont Medicare beneficiaries uh, receive their primary care in an attributed uh, uh, relationship with New Hampshire-based Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, providers. I do not know the answer to that to that question, and we have not done that analysis. I'm just concerned about that, knowing that we have that benchmark of 90 percent Medicare participation by 2022. And so uh, I raise that question. On the slide that has initial attribution estimates, um, under the cell fund, how many different um, insurance companies are we talking about? Yeah, so that really is projecting a uh, four hospital cohort doing a model similar but adding two sided risk, but similar to what we're doing this year as a pilot with the University of Vermont Medical Center. Uh, and so really we're anticipating uh, uh, and budgeting three additional hospitals joining that cohort under a single uh, program uh, as a bit of a pilot innovation model with, with multiple payers with direct contracts to one carrier uh, on top of whatever carrier they otherwise would have. Uh, in addition to the self-funded, we're uh, currently working on one contract with a, a carrier that, that does have quite a few lives in Vermont. Uh, we're working on a model that does qualify for scale targets uh, in a way that would allow them to bring uh, all attributed lives for all their self-funded uh, clients uh, in Vermont into a single performance pool for us. Uh, we are you know, currently under a uh, non-disclosure agreement as we work through the negotiations, so I'm not at liberty to give you more details of, of that program uh, than, I just, than I just did. Also, uh feeling a little bit of displeasure on the QHP category, knowing that MVP has increased their um, lives in the QHP program, but it doesn't appear that uh, they're participating in this year. So um, just stating some dissatisfaction there, that's all. On um, the slide for fixed payments, under the Medicaid, remember for month total attribution column, is there an equation that we could have so that we could figure out how these numbers have been achieved? Tom, you want to find that slide? So the fixed payment amounts uh, are something that we model, and we really, this is probably the one example where we model from the gross number down to the PMP now. We're looking at spend within for the, the attributed lives and where it's occurring across our network. We have these grids that we produce that show the attributing HSA and then where the lives receive the care. So that could be at their local hospital, uh, another hospital and now we're in a fixed payment all the way out to the fee-for-service categories. 
we use those historical spending distributions to estimate how much care will be delivered by one of these hospitals in the, the next year. Uh, th these are good models. When we get uh, revised data for the actual treated population and incorporate that with the experience that we're seeing this current year, uh, that will ultimately determine how much each of the uh, hospitals receiving their fixed payment but it's really our model of best estimate of how much care these hospitals, hospitals will provide to any one care of life uh, in the plan. Sarah, you did a great uh, uh, analysis with, I believe it was Sally. Yes. And um, what I was trying to think about, we know that hospitals have done the equivalent of a, a look at frequent flyers for a number of years. Um, huddling up once a week and trying to discuss those most frequent users of the services and trying to figure out a plan to get them uh, in a better place. What is different about your care coordination that is an improvement over what had been occurring in the past? I think there are a couple of factors. The first is certainly scale. So when I have spent the last couple of years traveling and talking in local communities about some of those uh, collaborative efforts to address those frequent flyers, it's often five or 10 or maybe 20 individuals that they're able to prioritize. And so what we're really trying to do is we take this holistic view and make sure that we have a care coordination program that is aligned across all of our payers is to add the capacity to make sure that we're talking about hundreds if not thousands of patients in local communities and making sure that we're proactively assessing their needs. So I think that's one component. Another is that um, I see the work that we're doing as really expanding that care team. So there's been tremendous successful work in looking at team-based care models in primary care as an example, um, and they're highly effective. But as I travel around the state, I don't always see that they are um, thinking more broadly or more inclusively about all of the continuum of care partners, but also human service agency partners and professionals who are actively supporting the needs of uh, individuals. And so it's really deep, transformative system level work that needs to happen. It's much more complicated than we might have initially anticipated, and it's really driven by workflow <coughs> development, trying new things out, figuring out what works for one individual and seeing whether that can work for, for more, and doing that at, at scale. Exciting. Hopefully, I mean, this is what part of what better outcomes in, in uh, cost of be. So, yeah, I mean, we're adding more tools to the toolbox, right? We we really are just trying to empower communities and those providers and, and, and even the hospitals as, as you know anchor providers in those communities to do what they wanted to do and not really had all the tools in the toolbox. But we bring some of our uh, waivers that Sarah talked about, our relationships that we built uh, in the community collaboratives with the community-based organizations and home health um, uh, and, and uh, you know, other programs and tools to make sure that we have a game plan for all of these patients that makes sense and has a, has a higher chance of working. If I could just add to that, I did bring one new statistic along with me, uh, which is that over the last nine months, as we think separately from our software implementation around Care Navigator, but we really look at the tools, the knowledge, the language, the skills around care coordination, we've successfully trained 586 individuals in either the core competencies or in advanced skills. And that to me really speaks to our ability to reach to all corners of the state, regardless of direct ACO participation or not, but to get communities ready to be able to join our network and to have that those tools and the facility and the knowledge around how to support true transformation. Great. One of the complaints that we hear uh, occasionally is that the approach to um, care coordination um, by one care is a decentralized approach. And uh, some national research has shown that uh, a centralized approach works better. And yet when you think about the history of Vermont with the blueprint uh, for health and the successes that were reached on a decentralized approach, quite frankly, I don't know how you would ever get participation without having a decentralized approach. So I just want to know if somebody could address the controversy of the centralized versus decentralized. 
I spend a lot of time thinking about that because certainly as I travel and talk with other ACO partners around the country, um, they do have centralized models. At most, they might have embedded models of ACO staff in certain locations. So what Vermont is doing is unique. But Vermont is often unique and in the forefront. And I, I think you're absolutely right. We do well in local models that really take into account the local conditions, the understanding of those partnerships. And so the challenge that I see is finding the line between making sure that we have standard measures that we have the data, the accountability, the tools to be able to support the education, the knowledge, the communication, but that we provide the flexibility for the, the local decision making, for the local workflows, for how communities collaborate together. And it is challenging. Um, it takes time, it takes honesty, it, it, tough conversations, um, and a lot of transparency. So people being willing to share not only within their community, but across communities what's working and what's not. I do feel very confident that we're on the right path and that we'll see tremendous scale grow over the course of 2019. So you just mentioned the word data and uh, that uh, brings up a public comment that we received and I felt the best way since you were going to be here today is just bring it up directly with you so that we can get an answer. Um, but the public comment is from a, a person in uh, Johnson and it basically says, um, could One Care Vermont please comment on its decision to eliminate the director of analytics role from the organizational chart? Also, the decision to add the manager analytics role to the quality manager who has no formal analytics education. And they go on to say, with ACOs fundamentally being an analytic um, revolution, how can there be a, a Qualify, how could there not be a qualified senior leadership um, overseeing the analytics at the heart of the One Care's request um, for nearly one million? Yeah, and so some of the publicly submitted input on our information analytics approach are a bit head scratchers. Um, not really sure what the source of the information is, but. Uh, you know, basically, our informatics isn't existing for informatics sake, it's to transform care, and it's to transform the payment model from value to volume. And so, uh, you know, in that it really needs to support uh, those two major functions, um, we did decide to put a little bit more accountability uh, for uh, the informatics uh, under finance and under uh, Sarah's leadership and uh, clinical and quality improvement. The individual that's actually overseeing that team on a day-to-day -day basis does also have some responsibility for our quality measurement team, which is in high alignment and included in uh, what we do uh, in an informatics uh, standpoint, but also had substantial experience uh, in a military role in large data informatics, and so highly qualified. Uh, when uh, we did have some turnover among our leadership uh, over the informatics team, uh, he uh, uh, oversaw the team on an interim basis under Sarah's uh, interim directorship, and it worked so well uh, that we decided to make that our permanent model. So to the degree that, you know, we're, we want to be transparent and have dialogues uh, in our decisions around the best way to oversee our, our functions, I think, uh, you know, should be within our purview to, to make those decisions. Okay. Um, my last question before I turn it over to the next board member. It looks like you're looking to add 2.8 million to reserves in addition to the 2.2. 2.8 million looks like it's from your margin. Um, in a doomsday scenario where one care ceases to do business, what would happen with those dollars? That, that's a great question and we're actually working through that uh, collectively with our, our founders and our board. It's, a, it's a, a really good question that needs to be answered uh, actually before the 2018 year ends up. Uh, it's one that has an intersection between our operating agreement with the founders, which are the kind of governing documents that uh, guide one care operations, and there's some accounting treatment and tax treatment considerations. I think it's safe to say, without uh, speaking on behalf of our founders of the board, that we were looking for a model that is reasonable and fair and reflects the source of the reserves and in the event of a company liquidation, we we'll treat those in a manner that's fair and agreed upon by, by the participants on, on the board. 
Uh, who would like to go next? Everybody's hand was up, so I'll call them. <laughs> I'll start with Jess and work my way down. <laughs> I'll take Tina. Thought you were looking for volunteers, but we had lots of volunteers. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you for the presentation. And um, Todd, I really appreciate your opening remarks about this is, you know, the beginning of a process. And the extent that the, my comments that follow are, I understand that you are working. This is, you know, uh, the start of a long. Uh, hopefully a long model that is going to require some work and some foundational building. So, but when I think about budgets, I think of them as, as forward-looking documents based on strategies um, to achieve some goals. And the goals I think about here are scale goals, payment reform goals, and delivery reform goals. All, if achieved, will down the cost curve and improve quality of care for Vermont. So, when I think about, first of all, scale goals, I was struck a little bit by um, there's a commentary in here about how One Care has not set numerical goals for provider participation um, and attributable lives by HSA and hasn't done an assessment of penetration rate by HSA. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, why there are no goals on the scale in particular by HSA and penetration rates and provider um, goals. It seems like we should have some goals, some goal posts. Yeah, and I'm not sure I disagree with that, but you're right, we haven't, we haven't really thought about that, and, and as you know, uh, with your long service here on the board, that, that you know, this is meant to be a voluntary model, uh, so we spend most of our time and energy trying to make it look like a great idea to say yes to providers and payers uh, to participate in the model as, as our approach to scale. And, and hope for the best. Uh, we were, we do, we believe at One Care in the scale targets that we're really designed to say the greatest transformation is going to come when a majority of patients in Vermont and percentage of revenue, if you want to think about that for providers or percentage of panels of your primary care doc, are in an aligned common incentive model. So I really do believe, you know, based on my entire career plus this all care model that the scale target is trying to get to that tipping point of you know, more than half and, and hopefully toward that 70% made a lot of sense. These first couple of years it was, could we attract enough and see where we are? I, I think that this will be the, the cycle into year three where we're gonna get more serious in terms of where can we make additional large strides uh, toward, the, toward the scale targets. Uh, one of the big ones is gonna be we need to get people into the Medicare program. So the Medicare risk scares some of the risk bearing hospitals. Uh, the high spend per beneficiary, the number of Medicare beneficiaries we have in Vermont growing uh, with the aging of the population, uh, and the risk corridors even at that minimum 5% on Medicare makes the maximum risk number for being in a Medicare program a scary number, even when we actually convince them that you got a really good chance of beating the target. Uh, uh, and so that's, that's one, is we sort of need to crack that nut of how do we get hospitals in for all programs, including Medicare, and that's one of those relationships to the hospital budgets. Uh, so I think we're going to turn our attention to be much more proactive in terms of, you know, what are the large levers, how many lives would they bring in, in, a, in a more planful way. So I, I appreciate the, uh, both the input and the question. Okay. And, this, and just let me just quick question, actually you answered my Medicare question, I was I'm going to ask you about why Medicare is so scary. Um, you sort of answered that in the uh, mm -hmm. answer there. But back to your slide, one of your slides on participating provider costs, you actually had a decrease among independents, a slight decrease among primary care, one practice, but then five specialty practices. And I'm just wondering, is there anything that we should learn, worry, be concerned about? Everything else is moving in the positive direction, except for the independents. So I'm just wondering if there's something you can share about that. Yeah, I think that the independent primary care was one practice that didn't, didn't renew. The specialist one is one that jumped off the page to me as well. I, I think it's reflective of the initial programming that One Care has developed hasn't really zeroed in on specialists, and that's why it's a core component of our 2019 model, is to start integrating them, in, especially independents, into our reforms, into our health system, and more clearly show them the value that the ACO adds to them and offers them. So I think there's a number of practices that just said, I'm not seeing 
so much out of one care yet, and I'm thankful for the 25 that stuck around and think that we can continue to grow this with more targeted program. Yeah, I think that the one practice that did exit on independent primary care was a pediatric practice, and you know, with our focus starting on high-risk patients, care coordination, uh, you know, the, the pediatric population isn't the multi-polychronically uh, ill population, and, and you know, probably it's almost benign neglect, but there's not much in it for them uh, currently. Um, and I think it's the same for independent specialists, and part of the reason why we're adding a specialist physician payment reform model for next year uh, it is to start to engage them more in the population health management. They, they can be really important in the rising risk quadrant that we want to sharpen uh, our approaches on. Uh, I think you'll see the independent specialist cohort grow as they see this pilot that we're going to implement uh, in, in next year's budget. So that, that second bucket of goals revolves around payment reform. And I think, if I understand correctly, about 25% of the total cost of care spend right now is in fixed payment. The remainder, from what I understand, is still in deeper service. Is that right? <coughs> from what we got? Okay. Do you have goals regarding that, like moving more? You know, what are your goals for the next couple of years in moving money out of deeper service towards fixed payment? Well, I mean, we do want to work with our commercial insurers to sell them on the attractiveness and help them be able to operationalize the fixed payment model for the hospitals. Because we really do believe that provides the sharpest, clear incentive for the hospitals. Uh, for value over over volume, so um, you know one reason it's at twenty five percent is that we don't have the com any commercial payers that are participating in the fixed payment model program. We can simulate it behind the scenes against a you know retroactive settlement against fee for service, but that is you know slow after the fact and not as sharp a, a, of an incentive. So uh, you know we we do have a goal to get more uh, of, a, of the attributed population in the fixed payment. That was, actually, that's my follow-up question actually related to that. Is I was struck a little bit also by the comment here, um, I think it's on page 15 of Scale Strategy 3, which said, currently we're experiencing limits to the commercial payers' willingness to align the business models with the all fair rate CL model and the program parameters in performance and population health management approaches set forth under the Medicare and Medicaid Next Gen program. So I am wondering if you can speak a little bit to some of the obstacles to getting more commercial payments into fixed payments getting on board. So I've done a lot of work on the commercial side of things, as, as I know you know. Um, and we're really running into, you know, you talked about disappointment in MVP, um, like on that for a second. But you know, they come from New York. They don't have a huge population here. They have a different model in that state. Um, changing, you know, they're not unable to implement fixed prospective payment. You know, doing something for the small group of members that they have here is really difficult for them. And so while we've had extensive conversations, we're so far apart on the models that it just doesn't make sense at this point in time to contract. But if anything from Believing in the in the model, understanding the model, sharing risk, sharing claims payment data. You know that's something that we're getting significant resistance on. The new payers we've talked to, uh, quality metrics. Uh, one of the other commercial payers we've talked to, um, they have contracts already in place with employers that have very specific quality metrics and incentives for them in order for them to share those dollars with us. We have to align to their model, not they align to our model. So I think it's going to be, well, we've had a great conversation, and I think we've done a lot of educating for new payers coming into the market or entering into the all care model. I'm hopeful that maybe in another year, we can really get there with more conversation. It's just we didn't include a lot of detail or numbers in our budget because we're not sure we're gonna get there for some of the payers for 2019, but we're hopeful for 2020. And, and that's, a, that's a great answer, which is, allows me to make the point of, from a provider standpoint, we want to align population models, right, so we can think of all the patients we touch in a similar way based on their, you know, needs and what we need to do to keep them healthy. From a payer perspective, 
they want sort of all their provider network accounts to follow a similar model, and they like to use their value-based purchasing as, as a differentiator in the marketplace. And both positions can be right, and so you sort of end up trying to find something that meets in the middle, and you know, we've got a, at least one pair we've traditionally contracted with that we think has been on the side of it works, right? MVP didn't quite get to that middle layer and sort of was a little bit too much toward uh, a model that didn't make sense for us. And so this is going to be a, a bit of, a, of an ongoing ev evolution uh, on this model. Vermont's not the only state struggling with this issue as they try to do all pair models or multi pair line models for accountable providers. I'm glad to hear this optimism. <laughs> um, and so related to that, I noticed Dartmouth Hitchcock is not in fixed payment. So is there any for Medicaid or for commercial? So how, how, does, how does the partnership with Dartmouth-Hitchcock and the movement towards getting them on fixed payment like the other hospitals? Uh, yeah, there. yeah, I mean, Vermont with its really focus on local hospital autonomy, leadership, and accountability, the Vermont culture really lent itself to Local communities want to be responsible for the total cost of care for their local community members wherever they get their care. Um, and so, you know, really we had a long discussion in terms of what does that mean when they end up at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Uh, and, you know, both the local hospitals and Dartmouth Hitchcock, you know, both thought that it would be better to leave that spending accountability at the local community. Uh, because we did believe there was a danger that local communities might start sending more types of care than needed the level of care a Dartmouth Hitchcock Tertiary Center could provide if they didn't have that go against their own accountability. So I know it seems weird that Dartmouth Hitchcock is still largely a fee-for-service payer for a, a fee-for-service provider for our population, um, but you know, no organization nationally has had a longer dedication to population health management and you know uh, trying to. Uh, take these uh, accountable models and, and make them successful. So they're not just another fee-for-service member of the network. They're a highly collaborative one at the table working with us, looking at data uh, to try to understand that. So, uh, you know. It's not a worry for you. It, it, it's not a worry for me. Now, Dartmouth Hitchcock, when they do attribute lives in the programs they participate in, take, take, the, take the risk like any other hospital. Um, but from a payment model perspective, even within the state of Vermont, University of Vermont Health Network, even though they get paid prospectively on a payment model, when they serve people from another community, that goes on that other community's dime, and we settle that up behind the scenes against those fixed payments. So they're really no different than the University of Vermont Medical Center is when people come from other communities there under our risk sharing model. I have one other nuts and bolts uh, thing to add on this. And that was it nuts and bolts <laughs> enough. <laughs> okay, I'll take that out. <laughs> So with our uh, fixed payment reconciliation model, we, we keep the home hospital spend for local lives as a true fixed payment concept. For the referrals in and out, that is subject to reconciliation, and Dartmouth does so much care when they're referred from other HSAs that so much of the spend would end up being reconciled at your end that it's just operationally easier to keep them a fee for service payer. So we haven't pushed on this too much. Uh, so that can be working on that. Thank you. The, middle, the last bucket, obviously, is, is delivery reform. Um, and so one of the areas that I wanted to ask some questions about were uh, involved the care navigator uptake and the, um, you know, the care plans and the lead care coordinator. Some of the percentages of uptake and percentages of high-risk patients that have a lead care coordinator have a care management plan seemed low to me, but I, I recognize this is the beginning of a process. But I want to just hear what your, again, what your goals are to get higher engagement. Sure. So we had a goal that we've articulated uh, to our network around patient engagement in care coordination for each of the payer programs, and that is to achieve 15% engagement. Sounds like a small number, but in our research, it's actually quite an aggressive number. We are uh, on track heading in that direction. I don't know that we'll hit that target in 2018, but I think that we'll be in good position to be able to achieve that in 2019. On top of that, we're really starting to pay more attention to some of the outcome measures that we want to see. So looking at those reductions in utilization of uh, 
admissions, readmissions, ED utilization, increases in preventive care, and those are things that we're really monitoring on a very close basis, not only internally to look at the effectiveness of the program, but being very transparent and sharing that, the variation from one community to the next, trying to understand why we're seeing some of that. At the same time, certainly we hear feedback as well about Care Navigator as a software tool. I think there have been some very significant steps forward in the, the last year. Uh, a couple of the key things that, that we've heard very positive feedback around are the introduction of event notification. So bringing in the ADT feeds, the admission, discharge, and transfer information in real time through VITAL as well as through a patient pain contract. And that has uh, provided value that all of a sudden has care team members saying, I really want it, I want access, I want to make sure I'm on the care team so that I get those alerts. Um, it's also dragging the need for workflow development around, okay, so five people get the alert, who's on first? Who, who takes the ball and, and really runs with it? The other thing we've been working very aggressively on is that we've heard some feedback about uh, how challenging it can be to be at a central computer, to log into a, a software system, to be able to access those latest updates. And so we've worked really hard with our software vendor and we're in the process of rolling out a mobile app, uh, something that's designed very differently. So just like we might download something from the Android store or the Apple store and kind of intuitively know how to use it, um, that's the approach that we've really taken with the first phase of that mobile app and we're pilot testing it right now with our users to get some feedback and have plans for really advancing that over the course of the next months. Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, Marie. Yeah, I also want to second that you, know, you guys have really put together a great presentation that's taking you know, some complex things and, and trying to simplify it somewhat. Um, a couple questions I have. First, on attribution, and there's some numbers that differ throughout the slide. So I guess the first question is, from 2018, it's on the back of, I think you had, is your attribution around 105,000, 106,000? Yeah, exactly. And then on your slide, that shows 177,000 in attribution. That's like a 70% increase. Um, and in your backup, in your backup slides where you actually do some of the math, it's about 144,000. So you may want to reconcile. And the other reason I say that is because your total dollars is going up about 35%. So if we're... Yep. So there's actually a good answer. <laughs> um, the, the total attribution estimate of 177,000 includes lives that we're anticipating under one of these new self-funded arrangements. We don't have any spend data for those, so I wanted to show really the upside number. Here's what we could get to if we can get to yes with the, the self-funded models. But I'm doing more of the breakdowns of PMPM spend and uh, things of that nature. I have to exclude those lives, otherwise the PMPMs will be way out of whack. So a little bit of inconsistency throughout the presentation, but my intent is to, to really show what the top end attribution number could be if we these programs. Because a lot of the expenses and programs scale based on the lives because that is one thing that we are committed to is some of the add-on payment models being applied to every life if we're going to do the same population health management model. Perfect. That helps explain that. And then when we also talk about scale and some of the goals, I think where, where Jess was going a little bit, um, we have eight hospitals participating all in, right? And we have four hospitals partially participating and only two that aren't. Yet when we look at the total lives right now, we're at you know about 145,000, you know out of 600,000 lives in the state. So it, you know, we're making progress for sure. It's just how do we get the because that more ties to their primary care, right, or to um, commercial. But you know to get those primary cares tapped in. So one of the things on your chart, maybe when you talk about you know where we are maybe the goals of how many are in that set. Because you know, the hospitals, we all know there are 14. I don't know how many, like independent primary care, or, you know, where's the gap is to show how you grow. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And really, the, the network development that we experienced over the last summer, at, at least at this point of the ACO evolution, is so hospital focused because we need them in to bring in the rest of the HSA. And it was really kind of an all hands on deck. Let's try to get all the communities in. And then secondarily, perhaps maybe in tandem with this other piece, but get them into all three programs. And then I think there is a very targeted. Let's look at each HSA and different providers that are there who's not in 
and do some targeted outreach in that way. The other piece on that scale is there's a lot of self-funded live and self-funded employers in the state, and one of the strategies that we have is to work through those plan administrators and try to bring in a number of payers in one shot, essentially, so we don't have to have individual contract, contracts with every single pay, uh, employer. And then, um, when we talk about the total cost of care for the Medicare, and then the total cost of care in, in total, and where it's striving to, um, it looks like 2008, so when you go to your slide of the total cost of care, and you talk about a 3.8% increase, it's slide 15. Yet when you go over the year to year, it's only a little under 1%. And I think that's because in 2018, it's inflated by um, you know, the shared savings carry forward. Yeah, so th this is a, another good question. So the way that 2019 is built is, 2018 expected spend plus the trend rate plus estimated carry forward shared savings. The amount that we're able to carry forward is limited by a couple of factors. One is the 80% sharing. So essentially we're giving away that 20% that we would have been able to carry forward and, and maintain that link back to the 3.8% total trend. The other is the risk corridor limitation. And the initial results in Medicare and is early are favorable, and between the conservatism that we had in the target plus some just good performance, it seems by the by the network, uh, it's looking like we might actually leave some dollars on the table on top of the 80% share issue. So really, what that all means is that we're not able to carry forward enough through the carry forward shared savings to get us back up to that full 3.8%. Otherwise, we. Yeah, and where I think that also is important is on slide 21, when you came up with your calculation of the 1.9% year over year, I get the math that that works, but if I did a weighted average of the 3.8% and then the 5.5% um, for commercial and the self-funded rate, it would be more of like a 3.3%. And you know, I just want to make sure we're cognitive of that because we're kind of starting at a high point for 18. Yeah, and that's why I said I think some of our work together uh, between the board and one care is to agree on how we're going to do those measurements. Maybe there's even a couple of different flavors of growth measurements that we can say we know what we're talking about. And even weighted averages, it, it, you know, do you weight it just based on the number of lives, or do you weight it on the lives and the spend per beneficiary, knowing that uh, uh, you know that that is what ge generates the total dollars. The, the other thing that gets a little tricky in this is in the all-payer model, any shared savings paid or shared losses absorbed go against the trend rate, right? And so on a fee, pure fee-for-service basis, you look at the green lines for Medicare, you know, it's really flat since 16, a great story that it's really flat, but we will earn some shared savings against those targets, and that's the reason why they need to be rolled forward and should, and should go against the, the, the growth rates. And so if a big part of the payments for Medicare is going to be the shared savings, both between the blueprint conservatism, which we did earn all the way back, plus additional savings to get us all the way up to our maximum corridor, that's what generates that 10,413 to 10,526. In our mind, from all care model, being the way Medicare ought to measure what the growth rate that they actually saw was, which is really 1.1%. And then just on the fixed payment and the calculation, I think, for the fixed payment. It, for my first question on, on um, just, just so I can understand the concept, if, um, if, if you're a hospital um, like UVM and you have your attributed lives and you have a fixed payment for those attributed lives who live in your HSA, and then you're getting a lot of other payments for people who come to UVM but are attributed lives but not to you, um, is that all based on a fixed payment, or is there any reconciliation to the possible what would be at risk for those people um, on a fee-for-service true-up? So the fixed payment that each hospital receives includes both components, and we show it to them in that way in some of the reports uh, that we produce each month. The, the piece that is for their local lives, so if it's um, Union Medical Center, the Berlin Distributed Lives, that's treated as a true fixed payment, not subject to any reconciliation. The amount that's referred into UVM 
we do look at that through the lens of let's true this up uh, at the end of the year using whatever available dollars we have to do so. That, that second piece is really independent of any risk for UVM. Those dollars, the risk belongs to the, the community that attributes the life. So that spend, even though it's happening at UVM, it's under UVM's fixed payment, is part of the accountability of whichever HSA attributed the patient. So the, that nuance between what the fixed payment is, which is really hospital care, versus the risk model, which is HSA-based, uh, is an interesting one when we build our reports. Yeah, so there is this sort of balance of trade calculation for each HSA that's based on services they provide to others that come to their community. Is that higher or lower than what is estimated in the fixed payment? And then vice versa, when people leave their community to go elsewhere uh, to a fixed payment hospital, is that higher or lower than what we budgeted? So it's almost a separate reconciliation. The way these fixed payment models work under, under the program that gives us the money is the tax identification number is either 100% in or 100% out. We can't just ask for the payments for the fee for service, you know, legal fee for service for services delivered to the local population. It's everything that they deliver uh, in the base year uh, for the attributed population. And then, and then and Todd, we can talk about something, but I, I kind of calculate that on your fixed payment, it seems like it's higher than 25%, I think it's like 37. If I looked at, you had 205 million of, well, even, even if you just had 205 million of Medicare and 110 of Medicaid, you're at 330 out of 850, that's like 36%. And if you go to each area, so like Medicaid's about 50% um, fixed and um, Medicare, I mean, Medic Medicare is about 50% Medicaid and higher. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it. It's, it's even helpful, helpful for me to see some of the ways that we can slice the data that could be meaningful to you. And then, you know, the percentage that's paid, not fee for service, uh, uh, sounds like a good one. And it would sound like uh, from you, Jess, I guess, some more targets and, you know, plans uh, for And then my last area is on risk. Okay. So a um, couple things on the risk in total. So you have $34 million of risk in total. Uh, I guess the first thing is when we talk about the, the $2.8 million that you're expecting to put into a risk reserve, I would just challenge why you don't put that in as an expense rather than as net income and put it in because I think we, you know, if you want to commit to the 2.8 and you're getting the reimbursement from the hospitals, put it in as the 2.8, go to the zero. And then if you become favorable to that zero, I guess it's your choice whether, you know, with discretion, whether that would increase the reserve, but. Yeah, I've had conversations with our auditors about this one and because it's unobligated technically at the, at the time, I mean, it's a reserve that really has no direct, it's owed uh, determination at that point in time. It's not actually calculatable, like we have a $2.8 million reserve, but you might only need a million. We don't know exactly how much. So they say we can't accrue it as a true expense because of some accounting kind of techn technicalities. But now you're actually putting it up for two We agree with you, yeah. right? And effectively, that's how it works but from an accounting treatment because it isn't funding a business expense against the current year's business activity. It's to have balance sheet to fund an expense against the future year, which is a shared loss payback. That, that's the reason why they ask us to report that. And then I think when you talk about the risk in total, um, because you're expecting to get reinsurance again, correct on Medicare? Yes, we are. And that would give, um, at, you know, the worst case, right, if everything on every single one went way over, that would provide $10.5 million worth of benefit. That's 90% of the 50% risk in that category. So, so, you know, the total risk is like $22 million. Um, on those worst case scenario, was you know we said it was thirty you know thirty five million. So I would just maybe you know because you're getting that, you may want to quantify, and then you have five million against that, and then the hospitals may or may not have other reserves. Yeah, and then, and that's right. I mean the whole risk management thing is is an interesting world, and you know there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to replace that policy uh, or or uh, get that swap place that we have in place this year. So we have to have a game plan to cover $34 million of risk. So 
you know, in that I don't have a guarantee or a multi-year contract that will be renewed, uh, I do need the hospitals to sign up for this. But you're right, if we maxed out all programs at all risk under the budgeted plan to have that reinsurance risk, it would then dial it back. You are the, the one, one of the reason that's important to show it this way is we give each hospital a maximum risk limit. Even if we did have a protection kick in that minimized our total ACO risk, every hospital needs to be eyes wide open up to that maximum risk limit because that protection that we get back could cover everything above the maximum risk limit for them. So it's important for each HSA to really know what's the top end number for them. But you're absolutely right that in terms of the ACO payment, uh, we, it could be offset uh, in a material way through some other protection. And I know that we're going to have some follow-up meetings with, with you guys in the hospital on, you know, how do we handle them and look at potentially that risk. But, you know, one thing I would put out there is, you know, if the best estimate is what we have in there, which is right down the middle, right, and the risk corridor is a, on either side, you know, typically in the accounting world, you, you only book up to that best estimate. You know, you, you could have overages and underages on, you know, every single line on your P&L. There's always risk. So, you know, I, I think it's important that everybody knows what their risk limit is and what their risk quarter is, but, you know, whether or not we actually reserve for that all or look at other metrics like cash on balance sheet and things like that, that they can provide for it. Because if you reserve for it, you just take it as an expense on your P&L, and the cash doesn't go out until, you know, a later date, if at all. So it's, and we're seeing some favorability, as you said, on some of the programs, which I think is great. So it's kind of pushing both sides. I would just say that uh, the worst fears of any uh, person running a meeting were about uh, 30 minutes behind. So efficiency would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Thank you as the person doing cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> I will be as efficient as I can. Um, I want to echo Jess and Maureen in saying thank you for what you're doing here. It's a, very complex design build, and not only are you designing and building it as you're doing it, but you're having to come and tell us all about it while you're doing it. And uh, uh, I'm very much appreciated for the effort today. This is a, a big thing, and if we get to 20 and 22 and you're successful, it will be um, well worth it uh, for many. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, one is just curious in, in terms of <coughs> metrics having to do with uh, Rise Vermont, and it just seems like it's, it's a, uh, a program that can develop different personalities in different uh, hospital service areas. And I'm wondering how you uh, expect to get a tease from the um, population health data, any kind of uh, incremental uh, benefits or effects or changes that are uh, engineered by the Rise Vermont. Thank you. I think you hit it right on the head. What we're trying to do here is balance a statewide approach with that local care delivery. And so what we've done through Rise Vermont is uh, work with a steering committee to develop a set of standard metrics that we'll be looking at across the state and really looking for where are their improvements, where is their variation, will help inform future planning. At the same time, there is flexibility and opportunity through these Amplify grants to be able to invest in particular activities that we think can really spark and, and highlight, accelerate the pace of change at the local level. And we'll need to pay attention to those and really evaluate which ones are more effective and make sure that we're sharing that information as we move forward. And is there any connectivity between uh, your investments in public population health and um, those that we approved in the hospital budget process with additional four tenths of one percent spend or these kind of your yeah, I mean, they're meant to be complementary, and you know, in that we don't want to have to fund all the needs for a local community, but sort of provide some structure and some resources that otherwise would go wanting. We, we hope and expect that the incentives that we drive uh, to do this and do this well will mean local communities will figure out ways to fund programs on, on their own as well. And so, you know, they're meant to be complementary and, and non duplicative, but I think that there's a role for both. And finally, for me, I'm just looking at the uh, Medicaid total cost of care uh, spend rate. I think it's, you don't have to turn there, but it's on page on slide 16. 
and it's relatively flat as, as, as you move from um, uh, to 2019 and 2018, it's one half of 1% per member per month. And in the year prior uh, to, into 2018, it was about the same. And I just want to understand, um, and, and then if you look at, at that growth rate relative to Medicare and, um, and commercial for Medicare, it's a little bit higher at 1.08%. Uh, and for the uh, commercial, it's 4.73%. So I just want to understand if I'm looking at anything that pertains to the cost shift. Um, is, it, is it that the, um, the Medicare rate is driven by the cost of the payer, which um, DIVA controls, or is it driven by the actual medical cost uh, incurred by providers? Well, I mean, it has both. So anytime you've got a medical expense trend that's made up of is there utilization changes and government reimbursement changes. Uh, and, you know, DIVA doesn't do reimbursement changes that often uh, and do increases, so that does lead to some flatness. Our efforts to do good population health management have managed to, you know, stem any utilization uh, increases, uh, you know, fairly effectively. Uh, you know, one, one thing that, you know, if you really want to tell the truth, the 3.5% doesn't immunize us from the cost shift, right? And for every dollar that Medicaid can provide uh, an increase, even if it's just to cover inflation for provider uh, expenses uh, that they absorb, uh, would have a direct impact on how much we need to do for commercial, right? And that always was part of the model. As a matter of fact, the all care model, if Medicaid were to increase unit reimbursement rates. We're held harmless from that against the, the target growth rate uh, because they definitely didn't want to do anything to keep us from doing that. I know that from being in the room that CMMI, the Innovation Center at CMS, was concerned that the most fatal flaw of this all care model, how we constructed it, uh, would, would be that, that Medicaid would, would uh, underpay or even go backwards um, uh, and that therefore it looked like it wasn't providing affordability for Medicare and commercial. The, uh, I mean, I just did a rough, a quick calculation um, looking at what if, just a hypothetical, if the Medicare per member per month rate was growing at 2.5%, which seems, you know, uh, within a reasonable amount, and that would, uh, if it grew at that amount, it would be an increase of 3.8 million uh, in the Medicaid um, allotment. And, uh, but that would allow for a reduction uh, of the um, uh, commercial rate from 4.7% to 2.6. I'm not suggesting that. I was just trying to get a sense of, 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 of uh, what, what the scale of it uh, might be. And finally, just uh, it's, it's, it's been a, uh, an experience in my life that's probably given me a few of these white hairs. But uh, you know, how do you think your all-pair model will respond uh, in the next recession when the state budget really tightens up, caseloads um, in Medicaid increase, um, and uh, uh, you know, as opposed to now, we're experiencing a situation where caseloads are decreasing. The economy is good; people are getting jobs in the private sector, but uh, that's not always going to be the case. Yeah, that's a hard one to answer. I mean, what cycles we still have to come in this five-year period, uh, you know, are going to be interesting, and we hope that that none of them will be so profound as to break the model uh, and the dedication to it. I, I do believe this resonates with the provider community, and this is the way we want to deliver care, the population health management route. I think that, you know, having some economics that are at the top of the, the spend premium and challenging us to live within those while improving the system is exciting work, and I think we have a lot of support for it. Um, but there are cycles to these things, and some of them are related to you know business and, and general economic cycles. Even some of that, though, can move in different directions uh, because positive economic conditions, you know, uh, might might mean fewer social safety net spending on one end. Uh, but it also means people don't want to spend against their deductible when they have commercial insurance, and it sort of has a suppression rate uh, on, the, on the commercial uh, uh, utilization. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see, see where we're going. I, I think the, one of the more important things that seems to be happening is through some combination of those cycles, long-term investments in Vermont and things like the Blueprint for Health, 
and the efforts of one care to really sharpen the incentives. You know, we seem to be in a good place on Medicare, where we're going to have decent Medicare economics uh, that you know help us fund the transformation, drive the incentives, and really do something of a reverse cost shift. For you know, you should root for Medicare to be above that 3.5 percent uh, as, as it injects itself into this math. So hopefully, that one will continue for uh, a few a few more years, and we continue to have success with that really flat Medicare growth that we've seen since 2016, which is uh, uh, on the actual pure claim spend, you know, it's a pretty amazing story for a Medicare population. Thank you. Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, turning for a minute to attribution numbers. Uh, so I, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, how you would react if the attribution estimates were significantly different than what you're currently anticipating. For example, last year your Medicare numbers were much higher than you expected, um, which I think influenced your decision about which risk sharing model to sign up for. So I'd be curious to know what, what you're thinking in terms of potential changes there. Yeah, good, good question. Uh, every year we learn a little bit more about what to project for attribution. I think the things that um, are the most likely to change, I'm just getting feelers for this, it's, it's not all that substantiated, is Medicaid, we're working on the methodology for attribution. I wouldn't be surprised to see this go up a little bit, uh, which would be a great thing. The, the biggest single change I think we'd experience is if we don't get a self-funded program off the line, that would be the most material uh, downside risk in the attribution model. The one care business uh, model itself all scales with attribution. Most things will flow with that. The total cost of care, the risk, the PHM spending that we make. There are some, probably more on the operations side, which is you know, a relatively small uh, portion of the whole budget, that are, are more fixed costs and not so dependent on attribution. But even contracts we have with our uh, software vendors for our informatics tools often flow with attribution. So if we were to lose the attributed lives, we lose some expense there too. So it is, it is designed to be a model that can absorb that type of change, not only when we start a plan year, but throughout the years we have attrition. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions related to care management. Um, and I think both Jess and Maureen and Kevin all touched on, on this. So uh, maybe what I'll do is just make a comment and then we can move on. Um, but I think the care model and the care management uh, information is hard to absorb in a written format, and I think the presentation actually is very helpful in terms of really giving us the flavor of it. But uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about that I'm just going to throw out there for you to think about uh, moving forward is whether uh, we should have our staff do a little bit more of a deep dive to understand more of the nuances with you around the balance between the uh, kind of analytical approach where you want to make sure that you have consistency in terms of achieving metrics across the state while also allowing some tailoring on the uh, local level. So no need to comment right now. I just wanted to throw that out there for you to think about so it's not a surprise if I talk about it later. Um, I did have a question around the share care plan uptake. I know when you came in uh, earlier in the year, you talked a little bit about how the ramp up was taking a little more time in 2018 than you had initially anticipated. I'm, ex I'm guessing that that's why your primary care spend is coming in on the lower side because of those $15 payments being tied to the shared care plans. Uh, and I know this is the hardest work of all, uh, but I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about lessons learned and what you may adapt or change for 2019 to increase that take up rate. Sure, so I think, you know, core infrastructure that we've been building and supporting um, is really an effective mechanism for us to continue to leverage. So we're talking about those care coordination trainings. We had piloted what we call care coordination core teams and really expanded those this year so that we have a north team and a south team. And those are really well attended. We rotate the locations of those events and there's tremendous pride and accomplishment in what's happening at the local level that's able to be shared around that. 
Um, so I think those are some of the things that we're going to continue to capitalize on. A couple of the things that took us a bit by surprise or that were um, not as in, well anticipated is the staff turnover in some of the local organizations has been larger than we expected. So when we look, um, and I thought back to our discussions a year ago together about you know, where might we expect the need to train more individuals in the use of Care Navigator, and I, I believe I said something to the effect of, maybe 150 more individuals might need that because we're moving into some smaller communities. In fact, it's been hundreds and hundreds. Um, I can look through my notes, but I believe it's over 300 individuals that needed training. Some of that's refresher, some of that is people who have been in an organization moving into new roles, but a tremendous amount has been uh, turnover or transitions in local organizations. And I think it speaks to the larger question about workforce development, capacity, the aging workforce, um, all issues that I know we're both all interested in addressing. Thank you. It, it's also helpful to think about for the, for the high-risk patients Ultimately, we do want a shared care plan, which means the patients involved in the plan and setting of the goals, and you know, that's the 15% number. That doesn't mean that we don't want to get resources and get medical homes in combination with their local community partners to have a plan of care for high-risk patients, even if the patient's not ready to fully engage in a shared care plan. So part of this is also to get resources out there to help the medical homes develop plans of care with their local community members. So just to that point, because we can cut the data in so many different ways, you know, one of the statistics we provided for you was that 46% of those high and very high risk individuals actually have activity documented in the system, which indicates to us that trajectory has started, progress is being made, it just hasn't gotten to the rigor of our definition of what a, a completed shared care <laughs> plan really looks like. Thank you. Um, at the hospital budget hearings, we had two hospitals talk about using their own EHRs and an integrated shared care plan. Um, are you expecting that this approach, which would obviously mean they weren't using Care Navigator, will you'll be able to still implement with your care model? So we're actively discussing exactly that in two health service areas. Um, we have conversations about what the core criteria are that need to be met, and they shouldn't be any surprises. It has to do with making sure that the entire continuum of care partners have access and the ability to effectively engage in that care plan development and uh, achievement of those goals. It also requires that data be sent back to us that we can then integrate into our care coordination software. And so we're continuing those conversations. I do think we'll move forward with at least one pilot in 2019. Um, can you speak to what you're using the state HIT investment for? So we have a large set of activities and deliverables that relate to that HIT investment. Um, we'd be happy to share a, a more exhaustive list, but it really has to do with the ability for us to be able to take in this information. We still have the, the slides showing the complicated yeah. system here, but it's, it's developing new visualizations. It's new ways to um, develop standard reporting packages as well as address what we call ad hoc or kind of one-time requests from individuals that might be um, highly nuanced and really need the, the talents and advanced analytic skills of our team to be able to get to a true <coughs> answer that can drive that change and improvement. We'd be happy to give you further examples. That would be great. Not now. <laughs> I just have one more question, Kevin. <laughs> um, I wanted to just talk a little bit more about the, the commercial program, particularly the Blue Cross QHP program, which I know um, you're currently uh, negotiating. Um, I think it's what, so, and in your slide around how, how you were looking at the QHP filing compared to the trend rate, uh, I know you indicated that you hadn't risk adjusted, but many of the adjustments that are built in really are, in my mind, designed to do the same thing as a risk adjustment model, which is to address the fact that the population that, that you might have in your commercial ACO program may not mirror the population that Blue Cross has either in the entire QHP market or in all of their book of business. Um, so uh, I was just curious if you could speak to that a little bit more and um, also as part of that, as we move forward with more inherent volatility and lack of stability in the QHP market due to federal and state uh, 
policy decisions around uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, I would anticipate that premium setting becomes a much uh, less uh, precise, it's not particularly precise now, I would say, but it gets even less precise as you add volatility into the market. So that leads me to question whether the QHP <coughs> and premium estimation process is even really the right place to start. So that is one of the things that we are struggling with, um, both Blue Cross and uh, One Care, in trying to figure out what is the right methodology. We do have contractual terms that has language that talks about marrying the filing, <coughs> understanding though there are two components to the filing. The filing is taking premiums from 2017 to 2018, which is different than taking a claims expense. The 2018 filing would be based on 2016 members, the cost of care from 2016. So needing to take, um, define the pieces that affect the cost of care and its unit cost, its utilization, its elimination of the individual mandate, it's the ability to move to AHP, it becomes very, very complicated before you even factor in what does the One Care cohort look like compared to the Blue Cross cohort. So we have exchanged a lot of data, we have been in good faith to try to come up with something, and then also say, okay, well here's what our contract said in 2018, what do we want to do for 2019? And so we're actually re-engaging, just actually st doing a start over, if you will, of Let's just look at like both years and try to figure out what's a model that makes sense. QHP is really difficult. It is the most volatile of any of the commercial programs, any of the programs that we have um, for a lot of reasons. So it, it's, it's not an easy task to try to get you know, a lot of different actuaries agreeing on really what should be adjusted. We just took our best, chance, our best shot at saying, okay, we're starting with our 2016 actual cost of claims Trending it for, we used about approximately 10% for unit cost, utilization increases, and then used estimates for AHP, elimination of the federal mandate, um, a population morbidity. That excludes the 10% was across two years, so two, two years. cycles. Of absolutely, because it's 2016 to 2018 on the claim side, which is how we're setting our target. Um, that excludes the risk transfers that happens between the payers that we don't have. So Todd kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, and that it's a, it's a lot more complex. You know, the Green Mountain Care Board made some decisions with regard to the process rate filing. With regard to the fact it has reserves, it's getting a $16.6 .6 million tax refund. Those are not things we have to offset costs, so we have to look at it. What do we really think our costs are going to be? And so that's, it's a complicated discussion. And so we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out what is the right answer, what is fair, and what's fair to both parties. I think we'll get there. It's it's just taken a lot longer than one might hoped. Thank you. So at this point, I'll ask Jackie Lee if she has any questions. Yes, thank you, I do. Um, I have a quick question about the, um, I, I was really liking slide 21, uh, where you did the blended total cost of care to see and I guess I ran into a confusion as you then moved toward um, my 26 for you. It appears this is based on the same data, but there's a, a different number there down at the bottom, the 479 versus like a 490 number on the other side. Can you talk to me about is it what the difference is between those? Yeah, sure can. So slide 21 is a trending of our benchmarks. And we're using that because ultimately at the end of the year, that is the number to which we reconcile. If we're high, uh, we owe it to back to the payer, it gets us down to that benchmark, and then we're low, we receive the shared savings check, and that gets us to that benchmark. So slide 21 is a benchmark to benchmark projection comparison, uh, which I think is the right treatment, but as Todd mentioned, we're, ha we're happy to roll up our sleeves to figure out really exactly how we want to measure overall trend. The, the other slide you reference is um, really our spend estimates, and particularly because of the shared savings carry forward for Medicare, they're not the same. Uh, we're expecting a, a different spend number for Medicare, uh, just on a claims basis, and that's what slide 26 uh, portrays as compared to the benchmark, which is portrayed on slide 21. 
So because the shared savings in Medicare go against our target or our healthcare model math, that's the reason why we put in the benchmark in there, the higher number. But this is the first time the actuarial model against one of our targets makes us think we're going to spend less on claims than what the target is. Now, I guess last year or this year it has been true with the medic with the uh, blueprint conservatism, but it's even augmented further with the earned shared savings that we're rolling forward on top of on top of that. Is that Anything else, Jackie Lee? Uh, no, thank you. Mike Barber, anything? Great. So we're going to turn on at this point to the healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, I like it's, good, it's good to be here and uh, good to be a part of this conversation. Um, I think rather than asking a, uh, this as a question, I'll sort of make it a statement and ask you if you have a, a similar concern. Um, when I think about um, one care having a reserve and understanding that the payers have to have a reserve and understanding that the hospitals have to have cash on hand um, and then also looking at the uh, risk that hospitals are taking on and having heard some of the conversation in the hospital budget process about hospitals maybe needing to have some reserve. From a consumer's perspective, it gets pretty concerning that everyone wants to hold my money. Everyone, for good reasons on each level. But I don't know how to reconcile that and I just would welcome your thoughts about that. Well, you know, let's let's you know be clear that, that one care doesn't have a balance sheet other than what we can have available to us or have pledged to us, right? And so we have legal obligations to write checks back up to thirty-four million dollars. Yeah, Morgan's right that the debt did come in that we wouldn't have to write that back to have some risk mitigation. But what we've done is delegated that to hospitals to cover that risk. And like I said earlier, some of that risk is new type of risk that the hospitals are taking on that previously was held by the Medicare Trust Fund, the state budget of Vermont, and the reserves at a commercial payer. Uh, we don't have the ability to force getting some of that extra money on top of the spending target from any of those three parties. Uh, uh, in a perfect world, probably there would be what would be considered separate from even administrative payments against the infrastructure to manage the risk. But there's, you know, a risk component, a risk premium, part of the premium that goes toward risk, would be built on, on top of the claim spent. That's just not the way it works. Uh, Medicare sort of has set the precedent for you want to take risk, it's based on the claim spend and you got to absorb the risk management expenses uh, yourself. So, you know, I know it's easy for me to say, I've got to one care as a CEO in isolation and say, I've got to have a business model that works. Uh, I have fully delegated through contract 100% of my risk to hospitals, but if they default on that, one care still legally owes the money. Uh, and so having some reserves of one care at the very least prevents against that what is actually called credit risk that you know the people who've pledged against our obligations uh, would, would default. So you know that's the reason why our reserves at One Care have been pretty modest uh, to, to date. I do, like I said in my closing comment after the formal presentation, do wonder as we gain scale and these levels of risk get higher, figure out how we want to do that. But I think we do need to talk about should One Care have a risk premium? You know, might we transfer through that method? Uh, you know, some reserves that are held at, at, from the payers, uh, you know, over to one care, and we can figure out with our hospitals, she wants to flow it to you and give you higher levels of pledged risk versus keep your levels of pledged risk low, knowing that you've got this bucket of money in one care to supplement, su supplement that. So I'm not really sure uh, I've answered the concern, um, but, you know, uh, all I can do is tell you what one care needs to do its business model means legal obligations. And your answer makes total sense from the yeah. one care perspective, and that's why I phrased it system wide. Yeah. Um, I don't know that the mic is working, so I hope people can hear me. Um, Speak loudly. We can yeah. hear you, but I'm not sure if the people in the back of the room can. Um, talk about AHPs for a minute, and whether uh, there's a uh, uh, was an offer to uh, have AHPs <clears throat> participate in uh, one care. Uh, whether there was discussions with Blue Cross about that. 
We did talk to the cross. Um, we did talk to the cross about that, and they were going to look that into their large group market, and that's a market that has a, again a lot of volatility. And we offered to do a one-year, do a multi-year contract, but have no downside risk the first year, so we could get into the model, see how that population differs from what we have now, know how we might mar model the target. Um, that was unacceptable for 2019. And I think also given that we really needed to focus efforts on the QHP, because that's a, a plan that we already participated in, and making sure we can come to terms, we just decided to focus efforts there. We're open to doing that in the future, though. Yeah, okay. absolutely. <clears throat> and then I think lastly for me, um, this, this also goes to a high level question. Um, if one care uh, works with self-employed insured, I'm sorry, uh, self-insured groups and uh, takes on or manages uh, some of the risk for them, I, I just become, a, 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 have a very basic question of at what point does an ACO start to look like an insurer? That, that, you know, that, that's a great question. Almost by definition, self-funded accounts are employer bears 100% of the risk for the claim spend, and it's a fee-for-service model, right? And that's part of the reason why it's really, really challenging to gain inroads in that market because they've got to agree to do something different. You know, we have one potential contract with a carrier that 10 years ago started to include some sort of sharing of, of outcomes and affordability and quality. Uh, in their contracts that they're willing to share with us uh, that could qualify for, for scale targets and, and, and share it with us. Uh, but, but you're exactly right. Now, the one thing that, you know, uh, these self-employers do want to do is they still want to be fully compliant with ERISA law and be uh, subject to the advantages and protections of that, including tax deductibility. Uh, but there are, there's a long, well-trodden path of how to bring value-based models into that, still consistent with ERISA law. Uh, the hardest part is convincing the employers and the brokers and the HR departments and the CFOs that it's worth doing something more complex than just saying fee for service. And you know, the reason why they are doubly tempted to do that is all the stuff we're doing for these 170,000 lives that we've invested in, Verm in Vermont seem to be working, right? And so it'd be really easy for them to be free riders and say, oh yeah, we'll just write our fee-for-service bank account claims because the growth rate seems to be pretty reasonable compared to what it was five years ago, and certainly better than it was 10 years ago. So they don't, they aren't feeling as much as the burning platform on affordability as, as, they, as they were. Uh, and so that's gonna be, you know, the tough nut to crack is, is convince them that they really need to inoculate themselves going forward from returning to that. You know, but really, you know, how do we get them to pay their share against this uh, and contribute their lives into what we all agree is the real promise of this is using, you know, having an informatics-driven healthcare system with a population health management approach where we've got a great game plan for everybody uh, that keeps them healthy and happy and productive, and yeah, that's going to yield uh, a sustainable low growth rate for healthcare services. Thank you. I'd also add, if you look on slide 42, uh, the risk sharing corridor is much lower in the, in the self-funded program. And that's because we need to have at least 30% to qualify for scale target. So we're keeping the risk corridors low, keeping the risk sharing at that maximum 30 because we want to qualify for scale targets. And so that's really the conversation we've had, try to minimize our risk. You know, we're not trying to take over the world, but still have them qualify. So that's a balance we have to consider when we're doing this too. But that's why you'll notice it has a net 1.8% risk. Thank you. Julia has a question or two. Um, so we talked a little bit already about how the commercial growth rate is higher than the um, aggregate target of 3.5% um, account, 3.5%. Now I wonder if you can just speak a little bit to um, whether you believe that growth target for the commercial and self-funded payers is um, sustainable in terms of the ability to pay. Yeah, um, my personal opinion is something probably has to get that, that we can't afford five to six percent increases for forever and ever be affordable. However, 
Um, we also need to make sure that there's a healthcare delivery system that's available when people need it. And, and really having a bit of a room for some of the conversations with CMS around the 3.5% growth rate, you know, the concern three years ago was, wow, was that too low? I mean, the healthcare model agreement actually allows us to go up to 4.3 with this targeting 3.5. Uh, overall, and really their concern was to try to grow a statewide healthcare delivery system at general inflation uh, has probably never happened since the Medicare Act in 1964 on a statewide basis. Um, healthcare inflation's national growth rate has been high. Some of it has been the incentives of a volume based reward system, but some of it is just there's been a high degree of growth in technology, you know, pharmaceutical technology, biotechnology. Uh, electronic health records, uh, quality improvement uh, uh, efforts, um, you know, much higher skilled labor uh, in, in healthcare uh, than an average industry that is very mobile and has very transferable skills. And so, so a lot of reasons that you convince yourself the natural rate of healthcare as an industry uh, compared to other industries, you would expect to be higher than general inflation. Uh, and so the idea was we don't want to cut muscle from the system uh, uh, as we try to live in this growth rate. So that's the reason why we set course for this 3.5% felt like the right balance uh, of it. You know, underneath the covers, does it somewhat codify the cost shift? Yeah, because Medicare made their deal on what they're going to contribute. It's the national rate of growth uh, minus the 0.2%. Per, 0 .2%. Um, uh, you know, Medicaid, like I said, there's a lot of discussions in terms of this could be bad if Medicaid doesn't try to get as close to the 3.5% as it could, uh, but we all know the challenges of the Vermont state budget uh, make that extremely, extremely hard to anticipate. And so we back into a bit of, of a commercial increase that keeps us in the ballpark. Uh, like I said, at least the way we do the math, uh, you know, we think we didn't even, you know, we didn't ask for under PMPM for our commercial all the way up to what we think would be a three point consistent with a statewide 3.5 percent. Uh, so we're trying to do our, our best ability to offer as much value as possible and live within a growth rate that we keep providers at the table uh, and tell them that these are fair fair business models for them. So I thought, uh, do you see your model as um, making the cost worse or better or staying Well, I think having lower utilization, keeping people healthy, delivering care in lower cost settings that our model and structure, uh, both, both you know, in sense and, and designs processes to do, can only help. Um, I do believe the state now has made a great deal on Medicare. Uh, that, you know, if we didn't have one care willing to say yes to the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative uh, and it's building in the blueprint for health uh, sustainability, uh, and, and our ability to have a rate of growth that seems to be at least right now in excess of what the rate of growth we can deliver as a system for the attributed lives it is, uh, you know, um, that I think we're in a much better place than if we would have, would have had to decide how do we want to sustain blueprint investments if we believe in them. That would have fallen probably to the commercial payers to be the place to get it. So you mentioned um, that in the model, you're held harmless if Medicaid rates do rise. Um, so if, if that were to happen, would you anticipate like, a relief of uh, pressure on the commercial side, or would you anticipate just a higher overall? Yeah, and it's the, it's the state that's held harmless on that, on its 3.5% in terms of how would that translate uh, to one care. Really, all we want is a fair target. Uh, you know, from, from, from Medicaid, and if they increase reimbursement rates, and we, you know, did everything else right, and the only reason we exceeded our target was they, they paid more, we do believe that you should adjust our target to accommodate that, uh, to make sure the incentives aren't, again, underwater from day one, because it, it's really, it's really funny, the underwater incentives are what, you know, cause people to not even try, if they feel that they can't even do everything right, and, you know, have it reward their, their uh, efforts, uh, that's what they don't try. Um, can you speak to what the implications are of the way that the all pair model calculates the 3.5% trend as compared to the methodology that you presented on slide 21? Um, so we're concerned that the growing Medicaid population with its low growth rate 
because it's also going to increase cost shift on the consumers who buy commercial insurance based on how the all care model calculates the 3.5%. Yeah, do you think you work on that? Yeah, so I, I think the adjustments that we made in the way that we developed slide 21 is intended to adjust for where the growth by payer program happens. So if we're seeing more lives increase in Medicaid, it actually looks like our blood PMPM PM is going down because we said more of the lower cost uh, people in there. So the, the intent of slide 21 was to level the playing field and say, if we had the same payer mix, here's what true blood and growth rate would be. In terms of how that translates into the Vermont All Payer Model, we did that supplemental exercise. It wasn't a slide here, but we applied our trends to the payer mix of the state of Vermont to say if everyone had the same trend rates in the state, here's what this would look like on the macro level. It came out at 3.0%. That was an encouraging sign um, to say that if, if this model scaled statewide, uh, this is what it would look like. I think doing those two separate things are important. Um, yeah, we could see some shift in payer mix statewide, meaning more Medicaid patients driven by economic factors uh, or just overall uh, economic growth. What's in the ACO is just much more dynamic. We get a community that comes in Medicaid only. We're going to see a much steeper growth rate in that program than the state would see. So reconciling those two to do a very clean analysis, I think, is an important, important step. Okay, thank you. Um, and then so in all to that, it's, it's been an understanding that the uh, 3.5 target statewide is meant to cover the entire population. Um, so if one care is managing to that target while excluding some of the expensive populations like newborns to mitigate risk, um, wouldn't that cause um, the overall rate to be higher? Yeah, and, and you know, we, we looked at, when we did our analysis uh, for the statewide, we looked at the scaled harder report that the Three Mountain Care Board developed that, that said there's 550,000 Vermonters eligible for scaled target measurement. And, you know, I actually broke it down into insured, self-insured, Medicare and Medicaid populations. There's also a Medicare Advantage uh, small segment uh, as, as, uh, as well. But really, that's part of the challenge of you know trying to regulate our population and give us a fair target. You've got to sort of understand, you know, is the population we have relatively higher or lower risk? So, uh, uh, in Medicaid, it could be lower risk because we don't absorb some of those expenses for, for uh, the newborns um, in our model. Uh, and really, the reason we exclude that is more volatility than it is that the spending's not there, right? It just is if there's 10 more uh, newborns that we have to have to cover, you know, who bears that risk? And certainly, if it happens and it's sustained, that would be a higher growth rate outside of the ACL. You know, but uh, you know, your 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 point is well taken, and that is part of the challenge of you know trying to regulate us as a subset consistent with the whole system needs to grow at the 3.5%. That's exactly the challenge that we've been talking about time and time again. So. Thank you. Uh, we have a few additional uh, follow-up questions that are more technical in nature, so if it's okay with you all, submit those in writing as I can take more of the hearing time today. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we look forward to it. We've gotten really good at uh, quickly uh, <laughs> answering responses to, to questions we'll look forward in the healthcare yeah. advocates. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie and Mike. Um, Appreciate the efficiency. At this point, we're going to open it up to the public for comments. Susan. Uh, Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And this is really a comment question for the board. One care in his presentation referred to their quality performance for 2017. And they referred, referred to a score that I think we're all going to be hearing a lot about. This is about my third time hearing it. They received 85%. It's really important to know that they received, for that 85%, 40% of the reporting measures, four out of 10 of their reporting measures, had no national benchmarks. So they could have gotten zero points for that. They could have been reporting measures. They could have gotten one point, but someone, whoever contracted with them, said, if there's not a national benchmark, you don't get full credit. So 40% of that 85% was them getting full credit on nothing. There were no benchmarks. So 
one measure that they got 0% on, that they actually earned 0% on, the only measure they earned a zero on, and they earned it because they scored less than the national 25th percentile, that measure was initiating substance use disorder treatment. Probably the most important population health goal Vermont has set for itself. So they're saying 85% on quality, but they got zero for a quality measure that really matters. 40% of a free pass. And you guys are at a disadvantage because you're considering this material about their quality performance and their Medicare performance and the quadrant, <coughs> the scatter dots. You're considering that in the context of your budget deliberations but you haven't yet received a report either from DIVA or from OneCare or from Blue Cross on their 2017 performance. Their 2017 performance, which was the first time ever in next gen, Medicaid next gen, it's really important to see how that played out and what the quality is. 2017, they were still in sort of shared savings with Medicare. They have some data up there. If you go to the Medicare website, there's no data out yet publicly for 2017. So my request, plea, something for the board, is to schedule soon, but before you vote on their budget, a full airing of their performance for 2017. The report on the 2017 shared savings was really late on DIVA's end. It was gonna be in June, then August, then September. It's out now, and it's being shown around some places. It, Part of it was presented at the MEB, but interestingly enough, when Alicia Cooper from DIVA and Tyler Gothier from OneCare presented at MEB on that quality slide, that was in August, those materials were not posted until today. And they were only posted, Connor, you'll appreciate this. They were only posted because I've sent, I don't know, six emails and was at the MEB retreat on Monday saying, could you please post these materials? I'm usually using that slide in a presentation tomorrow and wanted to have a publicly available, publicly citable source for it. So between DIVA contracting on very favorable terms with one carer and the Green Mountain Care Board not hearing the results, I feel like the two entities that are supposed to be regulating one carer are still very much seem to be either promoting it, supporting it, Anyway, not holding it accountable, not reviewing its quality information. So if that information is going to be in the budget presentation, which I sort of question why it is, but it's in there, I think it really deserves a full hearing here. So I appreciate your comments very much, Susan, because uh, the thing that keeps me up the most at night is worrying about how we're going to meet the uh, goals when it relates to um, suicide and um, overdose. So I think you really nailed that one pretty good. I think the board hears your comments and will take that to heart. Are there other members of the public who wish to comment? Seeing none, uh, I want to thank the uh, team from OneCare for uh, a very informative presentation. And uh, you know, we, we keep moving forward in this grand uh, experiment to try to uh, transform health care. And uh, uh, thank you for what you're doing each and every day to uh, try to make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So hearing no new business, uh, I'm going to uh, consider all business and new business waived without objection. Seeing no objection, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying no. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.